Holy. Otherwise, I'm not like it. Oh, good way to go. I was just wondering how this particularly fun to read this shoot. Oh, yes. <laughs> or tennis ball or baseball or something. Yeah. Right. It was like, a summary from the board. That wouldn't surprise me here at school. From the 22 <laughs> That would not surprise oh. me here at the high school. See, so it's right, their summary. Well, that's good with it. The public's got Right. Right. Is there an internet here? Yes. That's so, right. Look here, available now. Really secure password. All right. Is there an agenda? Are we? We're on. Who's like doing Zoom? Got it. What's our uh, password? Uh, so it's guest SD hyphen oh, um sorry public. Public and the cast, God forbid, is the word for it's between capital. We give you different things. It's motions. I know it's all our fault. <laughs> and I can't help you with your pin. <laughs> it's all right. Let me just see if I get on. Oh, I got to do it down here. Yeah. Okay, click on that. And then scroll, please. Yeah. Oh, you just turned it off. Oh, Jesus. Go back. Turn it back yeah. on. Okay. All right. And then click the arrow. There you go. Uh, give it a minute to see it. Scroll down. There, uh, there it is. It's about yeah. the public. Public. No, no, no. Not, yeah. And then connect. And then capital. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're good. Fred Curious, you're good. We're good. I'm ready to say my motion to return. All right, I wouldn't connect. I'm doing something wrong. You got force of public? I thought I did. It's it's the PSD public. I thought I did. Unless you typed the password wrong. I could have. That's the right thing. No, I could have. Yeah. It's a lie. Don't give all the passwords. It says I'm connected. It says I'm connected. Yeah, but you're not internet. I know. Why not? That's uh, not not that, not two. Just PS. Uh, PS public one. I thought there was only one. It, it won't give me any. Yeah, uh, so, uh, oh, PC public two. No, no, no. Disconnect. You should start, forget. The, the, find one that doesn't have a two after it. No, just connect that. I don't think mine had a two after it. Mine did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's hic uh, hic hiccuped. A little hiccup. You should All be right. fine now. Because you didn't do anything. Different. I didn't do anything different. No. It just took a minute to. Uh, it just took a minute to think about it. Little there you go. operator error. All right. Good. Thanks, Jake. Great, right, we're good. We're good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Portsmouth Town Council workshop tonight on the South Coast Wind Project. Uh, before we begin, you can't hear me. You have to turn the volume on. Okay. Probably just give me a second. I think it is on. Speak like get real close to it. Can you guys hear me in the back? Just gotta get close. Uh, yeah, I guess you gotta get really close. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll start over. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Portsmouth Town Council workshop on South Coast Wind Project. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to go over. Yeah, make sure your microphone's off on your computer. Get a little feedback. Yeah. You're not in the Zoom, are you? I'm not on the Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we begin, uh, I just want to go over an evacuation procedure. Uh, in the event of an emergency, there's two exit doors out the rear of the auditorium. We will head out the doors, out the front entrance, and 
into the grass area and we'll await further instruction at that point. Um, if we could all stand for a pledge of allegiance and a moment of silence for our men and women serving on the way. United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you all. <laughs> Okay, this, just as a point of information, um, we are streaming tonight. Uh, if anybody is going to be participating remotely, um, it's Zoom, so there's an icon for you to raise your hand and we would call upon you. If you're calling in on the phone, it's star nine uh, to indicate you have a question. Star six will allow you to mute and unmute your phone. Uh, anybody that will be speaking tonight, if you come to the podium or if you're participating remotely, please state your name and address for our clerk. Uh, that way we can keep track of things, comments. Um, again, this is, a, this is a workshop. This is not the formal public hearing. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do tonight is there'll be a brief presentation um, from South Coast, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to comments, questions from the citizens. I'd like for the, you know, Portsmouth citizens, uh, there might be groups outside of Portsmouth here tonight. Uh, so I'd like for the Portsmouth citizens to have first priority when speaking. Um, and then once the, once all the Portsmouth citizens have had an opportunity, then the other folks can also have an opportunity. Hopefully we'll be here no later than nine o'clock tonight. So I'll give you a two hour window uh, to get your, get your comments and questions in. If we cannot answer questions tonight, um, we will take that into consideration and try to get answers at a later date, maybe during the public hearing process. But again, this is a workshop. It's intended to be for information. And uh, what I'd like is for everybody, if you have comments and this is your opportunity to to get up and ask those questions, okay? Uh, so at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Lawrence and Kelsey to give us a brief presentation uh, of where we're at with the project, where they're at with the project. Would you rather us present to the council or, or to the public? Um, Will it show up on the Zoom? It's going to show up on the screen, correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, we're, usually the screens are in front of us, so this one's a little new for us. Yeah. Um, it, I think if you could just talk to the screen so that that way people know and you're going to get your chance to do the presentation and then we'll turn it over for you. No problem. Um, so I'll, I'll be speaking to town, town council, but just so everyone knows, I'm also speaking to everyone else in the room. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Kelsey Perry. I'm the community liaison coordinator for the project. Um, I will be delivering a presentation along with my colleague, Lawrence Mott, our transmission development manager. Um, we have three more of our colleagues here to help us with the question and answer session. Um, Kelly Smith, our onshore package manager, Tim Ryer, our export cable lead, and Aaron Healy, our marine science permitting manager. So we do have a good group of our staff on hand. And I just want to thank the town council for inviting us here tonight and all of you for taking the time out of your evening to learn more about our project and engage in this process of development. Um, and with that, we can move to the next slide. So I gave a brief welcome and introductions. We will move briskly through a project overview, the permitting process, the project benefits, and then get to the Q&A. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Lawrence. Good evening. The intent, uh, hopefully many of you may have seen the presentation, so we're gonna go very quickly. We don't wanna waste your time on that, but there are people also who have not. And I think it's a good grounder uh, for uh, some of the details on that front. 
Um, I have a sample of a HPVC cable. This is the, a cut of the real uh, piece. So in other words, it would be two of these. So we're just helping get an understanding of what size. And, and there it is. You're glad, welcome to come up here and look at it at the table. I'll put it here uh, momentarily. Next slide. <laughs> Recall uh, the lease area, uh, 20 so miles southeast of Martha's Vineyard. The uniformly spaced, these are one nautical mile by one nautical mile grid, which is one of the largest spatial uh, uh, offshore lease areas in the world right now. A lot of the European ones were much closer. This was uh, a very process with the fishing industry to make sure we had space as well as uh, commercial and uh, other uh, navigational uses. Um, the lease area, uh, 2,400 megawatts, uh, currently split into two uh, areas. Uh, we are focusing on two locations to land, as we heard before, getting to a grid connection, Brayton Point and Falmouth. Next slide. Again, an overview of a wind farm and all the many pieces. So if they are answering questions or helping or clarifications for this group, to understand the components of the offshore lease to your left of the wind turbines on monopiles with foundations and then around the monopiles will be rock or what's called scour protection. Then the uh, array cables which are buried uh, anywhere from uh, four to 10 feet, uh, often more than that in that very soft soil of the seafloor. Then you have a offshore substation, converter station, that takes that and turns it into DC, which allows us to have one of the more uh, state-of-the-art and small cables and very efficient transfer of electricity using two cables versus the larger AC uh, circuits that would be required if you use AC to then run from the ocean into Narragansett and into uh, Sakana and over Aquidneck and Mount Hope Bay to a converter station located at Brayton Point, the uh, our previous coal plant, and there we would convert from the DC to AC, 345 kV AC, with which we would then run and hand it over to the utility, and they are the ones that are in charge. They distribute the electricity. We sell the product to uh, the utility through a contract or utilities, plural, and then they just put it onto their transmission system and distribute it. Next slide. Giving an idea of just the general uh, map area, the dark blue, as you recall, is the area that's discussed of possible use. If you were actually to look at what the cable route would be, it, you barely see it on there because it would just be a thin line and that uh, dark, Blue is where we conducted a significant amount of uh, surveys and other work to understand to go around rocks, ledges, and other features and keep it in the mud and ensure it is buried deeply uh, in the route and allow it to uh, cover over and settle. And then, uh, as many of you are familiar, we would uh, turn to the northwest, coming out of Boyd's Lane and going uh, across the Quinnec and back in. This gives you an idea of the scale in the lower part of Narragansett Bay and out into the ocean. Number of cables uh, bundles is one, and that again shows the uh, in the ocean. We take these two power cables that I just showed you, and we put them in a bundle together. And then there's also a fiber optic for communications. Next slide. You've seen this again. Uh, the ideas I just hit on is. Uh, coming under through a HDD, horizontal directional drill, which will uh, be located on the north side of Park Ave, and will go under Park Ave, under the beach, uh, under the, the uh, sidewalk, under the beach, and then out for a good distance, and then would connect with the cables coming in from uh, the ocean. Uh, the portion is along uh, DOT roads until you turn and our current intended route is to turn right on Anthony Road and uh, make a crossing uh, on one of those routes to reach Mount Hope Bay. And we would, if we went to the eastern route uh, through Montauk, we would 
be on a portion of town road. So we would leave uh, state uh, right out and go on to a portion of town road there. Again, on the uh, Montauk portion would be a horizontal directional drilling, uh, whether that is from uh, just the other side of the uh, Old Ramada, the RWU facility, or near the golf course, you go horizontal directional drilling. So when you're going underneath the railroad, you're uh, on preliminary design anywhere from uh, 60 to 90 feet underground in the rock uh, and running down. And then you come out once you're in Mount Hope Bay and surface offshore to connect to a cable and then make the run up on Cope Bay, bearing again the cable as similar to offshore. Next slide. Here's a depiction of that. Yes, when you are uh, conducting the drilling, you drill the pilot holes, but then you do need the support of a jack-up vessel. So that's a, a typical a large barge. This is not monster. This is similar, really, not that much larger than a facility you may see uh, maintaining docks, but as you've seen on the larger uh, structures of work or ridge work where they have the ability to put legs down and temporarily jack the vessel up for uh, uh, several weeks or a month to pull that table through, pull the conduit through and uh, set that in place. That's a two-stage effort. It's the drilling the hole, putting the conduit in, and then you may come back and actually pull the wire through, similar to wiring a house. Next slide. Giving you an idea on a shore, something you've seen often, whether you're here or anywhere in bearing uh, utility infrastructure, it will go in a, a trench alongside the road. They scale there on the left of a duck bank and then get uh, covered over with uh, the proper sand, soil, compacted with a concrete slurry, and then to the uh, existing state on top, whether that mostly is going to be uh, the kind of gravel or, or possible edge of the uh, pavement of the shoulder. Um, and this route does not go through a wetland or does not cross ponds, uh, as you saw on the previous map. Next slide. Kelsey. Great. Thank you, Lawrence. I am just going to quickly touch on the permitting process that offshore wind projects go through. Next slide, please. Um, as a new industry in the United States, offshore wind projects like South Coast Wind do have a regulatory review process that is very stringent, um, often more stringent than legacy energy projects. Um, for example, our project needs more than 60 federal, state, and local approvals before we're able to start any construction on the project. Um, this long and comprehensive review process does create a system of checks and balances for the project um, that demands truly um, extensive communication and collaboration between South Coast Wind as the developer and the many diverse facets of our federal, state, and local government um, to ensure that our research, our models, our proposals are all sound and backed by sound science. Um, we have been in the permitting process for a few years, but we are still a few years out from construction, which makes us still early in the process. Um, there are lots of opportunities for public participation throughout the regulatory review process, and we encourage everyone here tonight and listening in to participate in all aspects of that. We have also conducted extensive um, environmental and socioeconomic studies um, to be able to put together the research and consultation to be able to engage in these regulatory conversations and also progress our project design and engineering in a safe and responsible way. Um, in fact, you know, Lawrence mentioned some of the survey work that we have done in the Saponet and Mount Hope Bay, and to date, we have done some of the most comprehensive um, research in that area to date based on our survey work the last couple of years. Um, but of course, we're not doing this in a silo. Um, not only we, we don't only do our own survey work, but we also rely on external scientists, external experts um, and their data to help inform our projects as those are the experts that are most familiar with these local ecosystems and truly understand um, the local environmental intersection between the ecosystems and renewable energy. Next slide, please. Um, and now I will go ahead and go into benefits fairly quickly. 
Um, so perhaps one of the most important reasons why we're here tonight and why it's really so um, important for us to be transitioning away from fossil fuel generated sources is the climate crisis. Um, quite frankly, climate change is not a concept anymore. Um, it's something very real that we're able to track and trace the impacts of right here at home. Um, Rhode Island in the past century has seen three degrees warming. Aquidneck Island in that same time period has seen over a foot of sea level rise. Um, so these impacts are hitting us right here locally. Um, this project in particular, once it's in operation, will eliminate over 4 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. As you can see on the screen, that's equivalent to annually offsetting 4.4 billion pounds of coal, 10 average natural sized get natural gas power plants or 860,000 gas powered vehicles. So the carbon reduction savings for, for this project are massive and very real. Next slide. Um, another benefit from this project and offshore wind projects in this region is improved reliability. Um, all six of the New England states share a single electrical grid. Um, so that means that all of us, whether we live in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, all rely on dependable energy sources from different areas in our region. Um, um, shown on the right, you can see this map. Um, that's a snapshot of our ISO New England transmission graph. Graph ISO New England is our regional grid operator for all six of the of the New England states. Um, you can see that Rhode Island is outlined in light blue. I know it's pretty hard to see, but there's a small yellow dot um, that is pointing out where Britain Point is. And you can see that there's transmission lines flowing to Aquidneck Island and other areas of Rhode Island. Um, offshore wind will diversify our energy uh, portfolio as a region. Um, and not only will it diversify our energy mix by adding wind to it, but it will also offset the significant um, reduction of retiring plants that we've seen. Brighton Point retired in 2017, Pilgrim Power Plant in 2019. These are major power plants that we need to be able to come up with um, you know, new sources of this energy and ideally clean sources of this energy um, to be able to keep our, our grid reliable and safe and giving us the energy we need. Last slide, um, so just to touch on economic development, I'm sure many of you are wondering once this project is in operation, what are the benefits for the region and Rhode Island in particular? Um, as, as many may know, of course, from large infrastructure projects like this, there will be jobs. Um, we've conducted an independent analysis um, that figured out that we, that our project um, will create about 8,000 direct full-time equivalent jobs. Um, that is just for the South Coast Wind 1 project heading to Brayton Point. Um, along with the jobs, there are also significant supply chain opportunities um, that local suppliers will be able to participate in by us procuring goods and services in the region. Um, just last week, we had our first ever Meet the Buyer event in Providence with um, the Rhode Island Commerce and Supplier RI, where we had just about 70 local suppliers come and engage with our procurement team and technical teams so that we have an understanding of what is available here locally and, and make sure that we are utilizing these services. Um, I'll also add that, you know, the state will benefit from this, although it's hard to feel that effect as a resident, I totally understand, um, but millions of dollars will be paid to the state in a submerged land lease fees from the cable going through Rhode Island state waters. Um, and on, on top of partnering Supply RI, we, we do have lots of other partners in the region. We work with um, local institutions like Roger Williams and URI to advance their blue economy initiatives. Um, we're partnered with other local organizations like Clean Ocean Access to make sure we're supporting their initiatives locally. Um, we truly do want to be a local partner and, and we're open to other ideas for partnership as well as we continue to develop the project. Um, and with that, that, that's my last slide. Um, we're really looking forward to the Q&A and, and hope that we can be, um, you know, informational and, and share some sound facts with you all. Um, our contact information is up there on the screen, info at southcoastwind.com. Um, the external affairs team will receive your emails if you reach out. Feel free to follow us on social media. Thanks for your time and th thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs>
Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so at, at this point, um, we will open up the floor uh, again. So, uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. If you could just again state your name Introduce. and address. Okay, my name is Joe Forgio. I live at 28 Equidnate um, in Portsmouth, a Portsmouth resident. And um, I have been studying this extensively for about 18 months now. Probably next to Lawrence Mott, Ma, who I admire, I've read thousands of pages. You've read, you've read more than I have, Lawrence. Um, and I, I want to read to you a document that I filed with the CRMC last week and the citing board. I don't know if you've seen it. I'll try to go through it quickly. It's two and a half pages because I think it articulates why I have concluded that Portsmouth is not the best route, that there are better routes that have less impact on the environment. I'm pro uh, environment. Um, I'm an environmentalist, which is the reason why I moved to Portsmouth. However, I do not take the position that we should harm the environment today in order to fulfill the promise of improving the environment in the future. And that's what this project could do. The first part to the CRMC is it's clear from the location of connecting to the New England power grid at Brady Point that the majority of power will go to Massachusetts and not Rhode Island. I will debate you as an electrical engineer, Lawrence, ad nauseum. I know what happens when you attach to a power grid. It gets distributed proportionately based upon demand, which is based upon population. Massachusetts will get 90% of the power that passes through our beach. Portsmouth will get 2%. Okay? That is a fact. That is indisputable. So, you know, you can look at all the documents, you, uh, all the studies. That is a fact that we can debate. I've read the Bureau of Ocean Management draft environmental impact statement and the supporting documents, several thousand pages. Um, there are other organizations like Green Ocean that are doing a great job. I admire what they're doing to come to conclusions that it's dangerous to even have the wind farms out off of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. I'll leave it up to them to continue to make that compelling case. But when I read the documents, they were so woefully inadequate in discussing the dangers of the cable route, almost as if they dismissed it. And I believe that the single biggest threat to humans is not the wind farm 20 miles out to sea. It's the cables that come through a recreational beach and through our residential neighborhoods. It said, let me quote from section 2.1, of the BOEM study, which is under review, and the CRMC has to concur with it. It said, it said, BOEM worked with Mayflower Wind to identify offshore cable routes to avoid the Sakonic River and identified two onshore route alternatives as described below. First question is, did they ever think of discussing it with the residents of Rhode Island or Portsmouth? They got two routes that were easily dismissed through Middletown Second Beach and through Little Compton because probably they also have significant issues. I know how the game is played, okay? They, they, they gave them two alternatives and then aggressively promoted through their marketing machine Portsmouth because that's the one they wanted, okay? I have to ask the question. Is it based upon economics? Is it based upon engineering? Or is it based upon politics? Okay. By the way, does, that, does anybody know, anybody from Little Compton here? Little Compton this town council has issued two resolutions by unanimous vote. I'll give you copies, I'll read it. Coming out against the cable route and the wind farms. Little Compton is less impacted by the cable route than Portsmouth. And they had a unanimous vote against it. Okay. 
So let me re let me finish reading the letter. I, I, I contend that there are cable routes in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, that potential, I'm focusing on the cable route, that are, that are, that are less impactful to recreational and residential areas than Portsmouth. The Sakonic River is considered a pristine habitat, which means it should be protected at the highest level. The CRMC publishes a map and they categorize type one through type four. Type one is most pristine, type four is industrial. You wanna guess what the Sakonic River in the Portsmouth Beach is? One. Okay, in bold letters to the CRMC, it says, this alone should be the only reason needed to prevent any approval for high voltage cabling through Portsmouth. Okay, the, the, the Revolution Wind Farm on the other, other side is going up West Passage. It's going to Quonset Point. You know, South Coast Wind could find a route. Maybe it's more expensive. Maybe it'll take longer. They could find a route that goes to an industrial site. Some have suggested Westport, Massachusetts, because they have right of way. Uh, we don't know why it was dismissed because it's a Massachusetts facility. Okay. So the other point that I make. Um, as the CRMC has taken some strong positions against the impact of ocean floor sediment disturbance of dangerous toxins, when you go through and you dig the trench for the cable, it will cause sediment disturbance in plumes across the tidal basin of the Sakonet River, which will have an impact. The CRMC would not allow a barge to be moved up in, the, in Narragansett because they said it would have an impact on the sediment. A 50 foot barge, they're gonna trench 10 miles. That again is another reason why the CRMC should not approve it using their own words. And then I go on to say, as an environmentalist, I thank you for all the good work that you've done. Um, you don't need a PhD in environmental science to know the impact of high power underwater cable tracing up a recreational area will have a magnitude, an order of magnitude more effect impact on the waters of Rhode Island than anything else that they, that they've ever seen. So I go on to request that first Massachusetts electric plant should be required to landfall in Massachusetts and not pass through Rhode Island waters. Yeah. <laughs> and the Rhode Island legislature, including our Senator here and our rep here in Portsmouth, to make that a law to protect Rhode Island from becoming the power alley for the Northeast wind industry. It was clearly an oversight when Rhode Island legislated goals for renewable energy. They weren't thinking that the Rhode Island shore was gonna be destroyed so that power cables can go to Massachusetts to help Massachusetts and the rest of New England. Okay. Clearly the laws didn't fail in protecting Rhode Island, the Rhode Island's reg residents. They need to change it. There are numerous alternatives, as I've said, there are industrial alternatives like Quantum Point in Rhode Island that would be safer. Another point to be made is the US Navy in Middletown objected to initial route to have it pass out the Narragansett. That's really incredible. Mm -hmm. They objected, so it was never proposed. It never made it into the BOM study. I respect and admire our military. Maybe they know something about the safety of, of, of high voltage underwater cabling that we don't know about. They objected to it. But if it's not safe for our men and women in the military, it's certainly not safe for the children that swim in kayak the wind off of Island Park. And the elderly residents who have been living and walking the shore for 50 years. Okay? So let's get on with it. Let's come up with another alternative. It can be done if the CRMC says, go back to the drawing board. If we as a group say, we don't support it. I shouldn't be writing this letter. This letter should have been written by the town council. Yeah. 
My name is Ralph Kraft. I live at 2327 East Main Road in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I also run Crafty One Customs, which is a fishing tackle company here in Rhode Island at 1980 East Main Road in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And I employ multiple people from Portsmouth, Rhode Island and Rhode Island. I appreciate you having this tonight. I know it's been a contentious issue. I appreciate you guys coming too. Okay. Uh, if we're going to disagree on a lot, I'm going to just handle, I'm just going to go after the cable. Although I will say you showed a nice little area of where south, uh, where your wind farm is going to be. I went 71 miles offshore yesterday in six to eight footers to go find Fogat, Ulysses, the cable air, and found them. And we, we both know this is a much bigger project. It's one and a half times the size of Rhode Island. It's not just this one area that we're dealing with. It's a much bigger project. Yeah, true. So, I want to see it myself. Because that's how I am. I want to be able to fact check. I've worked it a lot. I also believe in green energy. I also believe that we have to change with climate change. I am someone who wants to save our environment. I have two lovely grandchildren that I want to enjoy everything that also being a veteran that my wife and I both as veterans fought for. And I think this is hurting me. And what, I, what I really want to see is um, the actual reports. Uh, I will be very open and honest. I'm slightly dyslexic. And your book that you want me to read, I might as well get a freaking doctorate. For me. Okay? <laughs> Luckily, my wife reads much better than me. But I want to see the reports of what you're going to do to the fisheries by species, which I cannot find. I want to see the hard work. I want to see the impacts that will be done to striper, to everything, to mackerel. This is offshore, to tuna, to whales. We already know that NOAA has allowed a pretty large number of over 700,000 sea mammals to be bothered by this. We'll just say bothered. Okay, we'll call it that, right? So I would like to see more information. You are going to profit from this. I am not. As a matter of fact, I am concerned I may lose my business over this because of the fisheries, right? I've worked 20 years, please. I worked 20 years. I served my country. I fought hard. I believe in the American dream. I built the American dream. I give back to this community and I dare anyone that knows me to not say that I do not give back to my community and to the state of Rhode Island. Right? I want to see you do your due diligence because you are going to profit. And one thing that also wasn't said is that 20 years from now, when these things have a life expectancy of 20 years, am I wrong? Yes. What are we doing then? After you've destroyed all the bottom, after you've destroyed everything, how? what are we going to do? How are we going to, as fishermen, whether it be commercial or recreational, something we love, what are we going to do while these monies go offshore to foreign countries and we're stuck here with, as far as I'm concerned, an apocalyptic water world like the movies? I don't know what it's going to be. I'm concerned about it, okay? But we have to be level-headed about it, and I'm trying. I would like to say to the Portsmouth Town Council, again, thank you very much. Rhode Island, although we may be the smallest state in the union, we have a lot of fight, okay? Don't keep your integrity in place. You've been put here to serve your contingent. I'm not accusing anyone of a lack of integrity. I saw your eyes, okay? No, no, no. Don't, I, so don't keep, I'm just saying, you are here to serve the constituents of Portsmouth, Rhode Island, to protect Portsmouth, Rhode Island, and 20 years from now, if you do protect the town of Portsmouth and you're wrong, God bless you. Thank you for doing the right thing. If you give into this 20 years from now, when it affects our property values, when we see what we're going to see offshore, when our, our fish prices, for Pete's sake, to get a lobster roll right now, and if there's any lobster in here, don't, don't hate me, um, <laughs> are already at $30 a pop. What's it going to be? And this is so much bigger because you know what's going to happen up in the Gulf of Maine. And why are we doing monopiles here? Right? There's so much more that this goes into. I'm not, you know, I may not read very well, but I'm also not ignorant sometimes, right? I just want you to do your due diligence because you are going to profit from it. And I want to see it so that everyone can understand it. And also, I would like this to be more out in the open. I found this to be a very, very subversive thing. It's very hard to find information. It's very hard to get the word out that this is going on. All personally. I personally have tried to have people come out. 
My wife and I fought so you can believe whatever you want to believe and you make your choices. But let's please do them and do the right thing. Educate ourselves. And I would be grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, hold on a second. I think. I think it'd be good for us to respond because the gentleman uh, brought up some good questions. Ralph, Ralph. No, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. I, I'm still running the meeting. It's it's a it's a workshop. So okay. one of the things that we we're, are going to try to do sure. is if we can if we can answer certain questions tonight, we're going to try to do that. So it's kind of a, a back and forth process. I, I and I want to I want people to be able to maybe leave here tonight with some answers. That, that's that's all. I'm going to give you a chance to speak, and and I think they're going to try to answer questions when they can. Uh, I'm going to be super short. Could, could you please, mic. could you use the mic? I want to be specific because the gentleman brought up good points and appreciated his delivery. So I wrote down some items again directly. Uh, fishery impacts and species. Yes, those studies and we spoke with some experts yesterday to review how we're going through uh, the various species exactly within the water column and in the sea floor to uh, really advance and lead those studies. And those studies are being done uh, both uh, surrounding our project and all this is what you noted also you're correct there are many lease areas well in one lease area so i agree with you it's not just our lease areas so those studies are advancing and then life expense expectancy i just want to be specific the uh wind projects typically can be assumed to be anywhere from uh 40 to 60 years cables as i noted uh 60 and more and then the wind turbines usually uh get replaced every 25 to 30 but you um, use the same foundation and other infrastructure on that and then uh decommissioning so there is a very strict regular regulation contractual and others to make sure that as you noted that you're uh, not in a situation where uh, to use your words, you know, we're gone and we're held to make sure that if it's in the future, that there is a very clear responsibility for any. Uh, so, and then lastly, I, subversive and hard to find is a good point because I think what's good to say is we're still early in the process. And so I agree, there has not been a lot. We haven't done design work, we haven't done that. I just want to say, you're right, we want to make more as we try to get uh, more information. <laughs> learning from ourselves. Thank you for that. And one other thing that I just, when I was saying before, I don't know if you realize this, that the Sakana River is one of the only place, it's the only place in which I was surprised that the Rhode Island DEM approved this, at least as you showed their their logo up there. The Sakana River is one of the only, it's the only place in Rhode Island that is approved to be a young cod area where they raise themselves. And it's one of the only place, it's the only place in Rhode Island that is protected for that. And now we're going to run a cable right through all of it. We're going to kick up all the stuff that's down. And also, all that being said, you're going to jet dredge, right? We also know what happened out of Block Island that it didn't work. I firmly believe that the reason we're jet jet dredging and going through this is simply monetary. It is the cheapest way for you to go. Yes. All right, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and to Lawrence. Can you expand on the decommissioning? Is there a performance bond or a bonding that is put in place in order to have monies? God forbid, South Coast Wind, Shell, whoever dis disappears, goes out of business. There's money set aside to pay for somebody to de decommission. Definitely, no problem. Um, so just to explain the decommissioning process a little bit more, um, through the um, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management process, the federal process, prior to construction, we are required to put forward a, a preliminary decommissioning plan. Um, so that's required to be in place before construction starts. That plan will include a decommissioning bond that covers the price of, if the project had to be completely decommissioned, it would fall on the developer and none of that cost would fall on residents or stakeholders. But isn't the decommissioning Okay, hold on, hold on, folks. We, one of the things that we, we have to avoid is the is the if if a question comes up, counselors can ask a question. You can ask a question from the podium. Please don't shout questions from the audience. It just it gets out of control. And I just want to keep keep some order. Um, and also, I know. 
we've we've already gone through this a little bit. Obviously, this is a, a hot topic, but please try to keep some of the background talking that's going on to a minimum because it, it it's making its way up front here, and it's it, it's also hard to hear. So, I, I know it's I know it's an emotional subject, but please try to minimize any discussion, uh, especially in the front row, right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's gonna have their chance to speak okay don't be afraid to hear from the crowd okay yeah but it's not a mob okay i'm gonna allow people to speak it can't be a mob when people are just yelling okay it can't be unruly where people are yelling from the audience and all right this is gonna <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Hold on. Yep. 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 <laughs> We're going to try to keep some order. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Well, then, I'm Carol Noel. I live at 158 Massasoit Avenue. What's your name? Oh. Oh, so now you tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I my friends. I'm <laughs> proud. So, um, Carol Mello, 158 Massasoit Avenue, um, what's with Rhode Island. I've uh, been a resident for 40 years. Um, again, I wanted to thank you guys for doing this. Appreciate it. Um, I haven't bugged you too many about too many things throughout the years, 40 years. I don't think I've known all your faces, but um, this is very important. This is a, a livelihood of the whole town of Portsmouth, really, um, right down to Ralph and, and anyone who has fishing, uh, fishing obligations. And it's just gonna be a mess if we let this happen. I earned my uh, Merchant Mariner credential, um, to honor my father in 2016. He was a sea captain. And um, I also wanted to do that. Um, so I hold uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts commercial fishing licenses. Um, but mostly I recreational fish now. And I'm out in the Sakonic River every other day when the wind permits. Well, sometimes even when the wind doesn't permit, I don't know. So, I know where these prime fishing areas are, and I know what this is gonna to do to the commercial fishing industry and to um, the businesses that support us, like Ralph's business. Um, so I have to carry this, as a commercial fisherman, I have to carry this uh, NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service authorization that I won't hurt any marine mammals or um, incidentally take or mortality. So basically it says all incidental mortality or injury of marine mammals occurring in the course of commercial fishing operations must be reported to the National Marine Fisheries within 48 hours at the end of each fishing trip in which incidental death or injury occurred using appropriate reporting form, even if the trip is observed. So basically, and that's for marine mammals. And also, I just received this in the mail about my turtles. Okay, so very specifically, they have to, if they approach a turtle, they have to avoid any line or gear in the water near the turtle, approach slowly and carefully until alongside, then stop the vessel, putting the engine in neutral. They have to assess the situation, they have to devise an appropriate plan of action for disentanglement. If the turtle's moving, attempted, attempting to swim away from the vessel or diving, does the turtle appear to be anchored or dragging? How often does the turtle surface? Does it surface in a consistent direction? Where's the turtle entangled? Flippers, head, shell. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but it is so specific about what I need to do as a one fisherman. These guys are going 10 miles from all the way down the Sakonet River. I'm sorry, I can't even know. Okay. All the way down the Sakonet River. And I highly doubt they're doing this. I highly doubt. I highly doubt they're checking for turtles. I highly doubt they're checking for whales, dolphins, 
any of the hundred species that are in our waters that we depend on for food, that we depend on for the economy, that we uh, depend on for recreational use, for our children's use. I want to be able to tell my children someday that, yeah, you can have a fish dinner and I'll go catch it for you. But the mess that they're going to make, impossible. And then she said, um, this, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, that the cables, um, that you have a fund for cables. Well, I don't believe that because I believe that the cables that went from the Block Island um, were uh, lifted and we were on the rope for the state of Rhode Island for $30 million to pay for that, to fix that. And my friend who walked on Block Island actually stepped on one of the cables. He walked on the beach and he stepped on the cable and luckily it wasn't open and he didn't die from it. But, um, and also right now there's a lawsuit, uh, South Fork wind, they, instead of, um, see, see the problem is they can't be trusted. So they said that they would uh, dredge the cable, that cable. It's, it's not this company, I understand, but they're all the same. <laughs> they, they would dredge this cable. So they are dropping it right now along the seafloor and there's a big lawsuit out by the fishermen they are just dropping it and they said, oh, well, we're gonna come back in September. Um, we'll come back in September and we'll bury it. That's if you can find it in September. And what they want you to do right now as a fisherman is stay one and a half miles, one and a half miles from each side of the cable to stay away from it. So, I don't know if anybody knows how wide our river is, but it's not one and a half miles. It, in some places, it's up to two miles, 0.8 to up to two miles. If they do that to us, that means nobody travels up and down the Sakonet River for how long? Two years, five years, six years? And as far as the species goes, there's no way they've done the studies for each species of fish that's so important to our ecosystem. We have herring, we have there's, there's mackerel, we, we have the stripers, bluefish, summer flounder, uh, black sea bass. I mean, I've seen babies in my hand, little babies, you know, in the river. So I know that they all exist in there and I fish for them all the time. Uh, so I think I won't be too long, but I think that we need to be warriors for the mammals, for the animals that can't speak, for the the ecosystem. And I hope you won't allow this cable to be installed. That's the lifeline and really the most precious ecosystem anywhere that I know of in the world, really, because people come here from all over the world to be here. People come from, people come from New York to come down here to fish in our ecosystem because it's so good. And they're just gonna come in here and just rape the bottom of the, of the seafloor. Now, there's 900,000 acres of turbines going out over there. They're not the only company who's going to pull this shenanigans. There's 900,000 acres. There's South Coast. Oh, and not to mention, before I even say that, there's all the, all the acts that they're breaking. Clean Area Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act, the Marine Mammals Protection Act, the National Historic Preservation Act. There are so many things, and you're not gonna tell me that they are following all these rules. I am not born yesterday. Okay. 
Oh, darn it. Oh, I forgot the other point. Take your time. Oh, yes. Thank you. 900,000 acres. So, so it's so as these company as these companies get refusals from Falmouth, and they've already been refused from Falmouth, Little Compton, all these other places, they're going to say, "Hmm, enforcement, let me in. Let me do this." So I'll do fifteen or twenty more cables and for two to five years, and stop pounding, pounding, pounding. Do you ever hear a pile drive thing? That's so loud that you want to just cry. And those fish are going to scatter. They're going to leave this area. They're going to go who the heck knows where because they're just going to get the hell out of town. And we and once you've done that damage, you're not going to bring that back. That, that damage is done. You're not going to bring the ecosystem back. It's going to be a very, very, very long time. And we don't even know, because no one's done the study, is what these cables are actually going to do. What are they gonna? So what are they emitting in 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 a, um, in sound in in um, EMFs for anything bad for fish that they're always going to be hearing that hum, you know that humming sound? They're not going to want to be near it. They're not going to want to be there. And with nine hundred thousand, so there's uh, South Fork. Um, there's a bunch of them. I had them written here. Oh, what's that? The right project to well, Yeah, it's South Fork, South Wind. Oh, here we go. Mayflower Wind, Vineyard Wind, Bay State Wind, Sunrise Wind, New England Wind. You know, they've conveniently made these little uh, companies, LLCs, so that if one gets banged, another one won't get in trouble. Um, South Fork Wind, Revolution Wind, Beacon Wind, Liberty Wind. That's a lot of wind. And that is in prime fishing area. That whole area where I grew up fishing with my dad, we threw fish pots out there. We, a lot of people here who are fishermen know that that is prime area. And so as they get refused from other people, if we let them in, then they're gonna start saying, oh, okay. So this next company will come and now what's your excuse to refuse them? What's your excuse to refuse them? Now you're just letting everybody in and that's gonna be even a worse disaster than, than you could think of. This is gonna be bad. So, so I did, I'm not dyslexic and I did read some of this report and so the habitat areas, so fisheries habitat impact minimization. So the habitat areas of particular concern in the Sakonet River. The Sakonet River supports EFH for 16 fish species, species, sorry, there's more than 16, but that's okay. See, they haven't done their homework. And has HAPCs for summer flounder and Atlantic cod. To address this concern, Bohm developed onshore cable route options that would be avoid placing the offshore export cable in the Sakonet River. It's right in the report that we they do not even recommend going in the Sakonet River. Mm -hmm. I do. It is in their own report is that they Within the, within the lease area, and I'm just going to read the sentence because this is the only most important sentence. Within the lease area to help the state of Massachusetts achieve renewable energy goals. Guess what it doesn't say? It doesn't say Rhode Island. It doesn't say us, Portsmouth. It doesn't say us at all. And I also read in the report that the other corridor, which is going into Brayton Point, is gonna have multiple export cables, not just two. And that's right in their report also, multiple. So I'm gonna ask you guys to please, and I never beg for anything, but I'm begging this time. I don't, I don't I'm not a beggar, but right now I am begging, please don't 
hand this precious ecosystem over to these seismic, excuse me, surveys and scare the animals into behaviors that aren't normal. There's so many things I didn't talk about and I'm not gonna talk about the whales and all of that because there's been, you know, whale carcasses everywhere. Um, but I just want you guys, um, you know, to look for the data. Federal officials haven't provided adequate research, so we don't even really know what the impact of the marine life will be on that. Um, we need you respectfully, town council, to say no and to be loyal to us, to be brave enough to say no, and to be true to your hearts, to our hearts. And we appreciate it. We appreciate you taking this. I think my name is Elsa Paul. I live in a road. I'm an engineer and, and I try and take an engineering and then be a perspective here. I'm data driven, so I've got a lot of data that I think confronts some of the speakers. Um, first, a data point that you may not be aware of. The project developer has a uh, projected life of 20 to 30 years on the turbines. However, there's an investment tax credit that expires. So a developer is given an additional investment tax credit after 10 years or what they call repositioning, repowering of the turbine. The gears wear out, the turbines break, something falls. So these things do not last 30 or 40 years. Probably every 10 years, there's gonna be need for repositioning, which gives an incentive, perversely, to the developer to replace these things. That's the same one. That's an interesting data point. Business perspective. Secondly, um, you all know that the turbines create kinetic energy, which changes the water uh, flow. The turbine uh, waves, they have water columns that disturb the um, marine life. The biggest impact probably will be at Zooplank, which this um, the increased water turbines was disturbed, if I can use that word, to the uh, lines of the zoo plant. And that's the big issue with right whales, is right whales require uh, the, their small feeders, they need a lot of zoo plants, to, and if the zoo plant that disappears, um, the whale or the disturbed, the, the uh, Right whales they have to work harder to get more energy and that impacts their life. Either um, reduce calving, reduce my breeding or movement. So that's another significant data point about the impact of the kinetic energy of the turbines on the water and therefore um, the, the ecosystem. I third point that I want to make to kind of reiterate of what Joe said. It appears to me a better route would be not to go up the Sakana, or preferably turn west on West Passage, on the West Bank of West Passage, and connect to Quonset uh, Point, where a revolution is plans to have two cables. The impact of, with the Navy, the Navy did not want the cables on the east side of West Passage. That was their concern. 
but they can put it on the west shore of West Bastards to uh, crowd support. And there is a hop, skip, and a jump land to Brayton Point, which is an industrial area. And given the fact that, uh, I think I got this right, they're building that huge tunnel from East Providence into, uh, into Narragansett Bay. Well, clearly, two tables of you're so big, they're not going to have the impact as, as this huge uh, tunnel. So the better place is to do the landfall in an industrial zone area and then shoot up the, uh, I guess it's uh, 30, 20 or 30 miles to Brayton Point. A second uh, less uh, useful route would be to go to New Bedford because New Bedford is uh, already getting benefit from their facility. They've got docking and they're going to have all their uh, service boats. So they're more receptive, it appears to me, to this kind of process than, than the uh, fishing uh, river he went, or, you know, fishing in here. So those are a couple of specific data points that I thought you should know to correct of some misconception. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my name is Corey Wheeler Forrest, 587 Boyd's Lane. I'm, I'm a fourth generation Portsmouth resident. I'm a fish dealer, a third generation commercial fisherman out of Sakana Point on my dad's side. And my mother's ancestors have been fishing these same waters in the same fishery as I since the 1800s. Along with my father, who I work with every day, two brothers, my son, my daughter, and my niece, we all grew up working in our family's fishing business. Every commercial fisherman I know, including myself, is an environmentalist and conservationist to the core. It is our future. Hard work, perseverance, and fighting for what we do and love brings us here. The fact that hope is our ocean state's motto is essential. In the most basic sense, we are working with nature and feeding people. But in reality, the fishing industry is a big machine with lots of working parts. Commercial and recreational fishing, charters, processors, retail dealers, service and supply, wholesalers and tackle shops make up over 3,000 jobs and over 500 million gross sales in Rhode Island. The East Coast is home to New Bedford, the largest grossing port in the US, and the Fulton fish market, the second largest fresh seafood market in the world. New England and the Atlantic states create $2 billion in economic value and tens of thousands of jobs. Not only Rhode Island fishermen, but fishermen up and down the East Coast are dependent on the migratory path of fish along the coastline. Fish like striped bass, scup, sea bass, bluefish, squid, fluke, butterfish, bonita, to name a few. My own family's fishery is historical and unique to Rhode Island, and it's been around for 200 years. How will 1,400 square miles, 900,000 acres, an area the size of Rhode Island of ocean industrialization, thousands of wind turbines that are hundreds of feet taller than the tallest building in Boston, plus the cables install, installed up the Sakonet River under our beaches and coastal eco ecosystem, going to impact our fisheries, our food source, and the migrations we all depend on now and for future generations. U.S. fishermen are required by law to adhere to the strictest rules and regulations, making us a global leader in sustainable seafood. U.S. seafood must be caught according to fishery management plans that consider social and economic outcomes for fishing communities, prevent overfishing, rebuild depleted stocks, minimize bycatch and interactions with protected species, and identify and conserve essential fish habitat. Just like the laws that, gov that govern and make our fisheries sustainable, shouldn't the wind farms be required to adhere to those same standards, to consider the social and economic outcomes, to consider the significant impact to our culture and community and the irreversible damage to the marine ecosystem? Who will suffer when the damage is done and who will be held accountable? South Coast Wind is planned to get fully permitted and improved by this January, 
Revolution win by October, Sunrise win by November. That's only three of nine companies coming to our coastline. There are far too many uncertainties, controversies, and questions for this unchartered, unprecedented, large-scale, long-term project to be gaining the momentum it already has. The process is rushed, and many people are just learning about it. What does it say about us, the ocean state? Respectfully, what does it say about you when the preservation and protection of our coastal resources is at stake and we turn our pristine waters into an industrial park? In the words of marine biologist, writer, and conservationist Rachel Carson, the mistakes that are made now are made for all time. If you have any hope for Rhode Island, please don't allow this. Yes. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Jeff Shard. I live at 55 William Sutter Lane. I've been here for 30 years. I know almost all of you, perhaps, uh, which is a wonderful thing about our community. We're small, but we're observant. When I found out that we're gonna talk about the wind turbines and I said, you know, what does Jeff know about wind turbines? So where do you go to get information? So you go down the net and you read and you read and you read. And it's, it's an endless supply of information. Wind turbining is not the answer to global warming, it is not going to solve all the problems that we have. There's many solutions that we have to, to maybe the fossil fuel issue. But when you think about what's going on globally with wind turbines, you have to get to the literature. You've got to know how much power, how much money, how much business is associated with this wind turbine. We're a small place. We can't be over, overrun by the big business of wind turbine. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give uh, the, uh, the town clerk a couple of things, a couple of uh, things that I have developed uh, in, in my search, which is information that talks to all the problems associated with wind turbine. And without telling you any, any of the specifics, I mean, you, you just heard from a professional fishing woman, and, and she knows from when she speaks, this is important to us. But it's much more than just the fishing side of it. There, I, I, I had 10, 10 specific reasons why you don't, why there are disadvantages to, to wind turbine. And the fact that they're going to put all these things out in the middle of the ocean, I'm a retired naval officer. I've been on the ocean. You're a fisherman and your radar doesn't work because there's a wind turbine making dis distortions in your radar. It's a danger. And here we are going to put thousands of these things in the middle of the ocean. It's a serious problem. And we in Portsmouth can only do our small part. I would hope each and every one of you would say, no, we do not want those things. Good evening to everybody. My name is Linda St. Lawrence. My family has lived in Island Park for almost 80 years. I'm speaking tonight as a representative of the community of Island Park and the waters down there. Boyd's Lane, to people who don't live down there, may think it's just a swampy looking section of Island Park. It's a hatchery, it's a nursery. There's white birds that live in the trees down there. And there's shrimp and small sea life that hatch in the Boyd's Lane waters and the mud. Now, the coves in Island Park are not just Bluebell Point, Bluebell Cove. There's Old Orchard Cove, which will be affected. That's right off Boyd's Lane. There's Old Orchard Cove Inlet, where I live, where I see all the hatcheries. For years, we've seeded that water. There's Long Neck Cove. There's Island Park Cove, that's at the end of uh, Riverside Street, and then there's Bluebell Cove, Bluebell Cove. So you're talking about not only the sea life, the waters that will be destroyed, the coastline that will be destroyed where I live and where everybody else that lives in Island Park on that side. And, th and then you're talking about how people's lives will be changed. I will no longer be able to hear peace and quiet. Neither will anybody else who lives in Island Park. 
This town council needs to be held accountable for the lives of the people who pay the taxes of this town. I am fed up with my family being abused for the sake of profit in this town. And I'm not just talking about tonight's issue. And you all know me, some of you do. And I'm asking you to stop playing around with the lives of people and now the lives of the sea. There's not one person that came here tonight is in agreement with this going down. And the only reason this town council will permit it is for greed because we are solar panel people. Let those other towns go solar panel and leave our seawaters alone. Leave the hatcheries alone because I am speaking as a witness I know the cove. My family's lived down there for close to 80 years. Believe me, it's a hatchery area. These people who spoke as fishermen, I'm not a fisherman. I'm a native. I've lived in Portsmouth all my life. Take me serious because I do intend to get a signature of every person in Island Park. I'm getting signatures because I don't believe anybody on this panel is taking people in Portsmouth serious. That's why we're here tonight. You're playing around, not only with the sea life, but everybody's hair life. I, I, am, I am getting signatures because I do not want to see the future destroyed on a promise that I've heard. I don't believe anything that was said here tonight. I'm sorry. Anybody will say anything to get what they want. Right. Jeannie Smith, 39 Morgan Street, Island Park. I just have two quick questions for South Coast. Question number one, has Portsmouth already signed a host community agreement with you? No. You, we have not. No. Just, I, I want to know Thank the truth. Thank you. I, okay. Thank you for asking that question. Can you please speak on mic? I really want to address this, and I don't want to interrupt your questions, but you've asked a very excellent question, so I want to make sure it's clear. So uh, I want to make sure uh, the question was, have we signed an HCA? Was that host community host, agreement. Host community agreement. Correct. Host community agreement HCA. So we have signed nothing. Um, we uh, had an initial meeting when, uh, as you recall, we went to the, in front of the town council. Many of you were there or listening last August, and then we asked the town how they wanted to uh, proceed, and uh, they said, well, usually you do a host community agreement. We said, okay, and uh, we had one uh, meeting with staff of the town, and they said, well, you, you know, what are you guys going to do? And we had discussions about how that would proceed. We never shared agreements. The meeting lasted, I don't know, uh, an hour. And it's, uh, that's it, there's nothing. And we stopped any proceedings there. I wanna be very clear. There's been no agreements passed between okay. us or anything. I have one no more talking question. about money. I, I have one more question. How, how do you make partnerships? Explain your partnerships. You said you have Roger Williams, Clean Ocean, US Sailing, Portsmouth Little League, Greater Newport Chamber. How do you get these partnerships? Do you pay them? <laughs> yes. Um, so often, yes, we do contribute to the initiatives yeah. that we have going on. Yeah. So yeah. Are, yeah. Often there are initiatives that but we you use. You use green initiatives. We're helping them with their green initiatives. Who's the mic? Okay. Well, it aligns with Money our, our mission um, because, you know, we often care about the initiatives that organizations like Roger Williams and, and you know, Clean Ocean Access are, are working on. And, and also we, we want to be part of this community. And, yeah, you, want you know, of, we, we want to show that um, we're willing to contribute to what's going on and that we're paying attention. Um, and we are aligned with the missions of a lot of these groups and want to make sure we're contributing to things Give that- money. Give them money. Give them money. We aren't just throwing out money, I promise. I mean, we get sponsorship and, and partnership requests all the time. and. You know, we, we really only give out funds where we feel like it, it's contributing something to the community and aligns with our mission. Um, and generally, it's because we want to be a community partner and to show that we're present in town. So what do you want to pay for today? 
Okay, wait. Okay, yeah. Let's. Well, no, I'll, I'll answer the question. I'll, I'll answer the question. And if you want, you can go back up to the microphone. The question is being written here. Well, your 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 oh. question was, what are you paying, Portsmouth? Yes. There there hasn't been any decisions on anything yet. As as Mr. Mott said, there was some initial conversation. Nothing is official. There is no host community agreement. At a prior council meeting, when I gave an update, I, I actually mentioned that any host community agreement, if it's agreed upon, would be discussed in a town council meeting, public meeting, and voted on in public. So the town would know full well what's in an agreement before any decisions are made. Nothing has been determined. Okay, I, I just know that you've had executive meetings, executive meetings with South Coast. So why the no. transparency? No, no. Let me let me explain. Like any negotiation that the town gets into, there's a negotiation process. Negotiations are done in executive session. That's the privilege of executive session. It's a negotiation. That's where things are are outlined. Things are formed. No final decisions are made in executive session. Any final decision would be presented out in public and a decision would be made in public. Okay. It's like any other contract that the town enters into with the police union, fire union. Those, those contracts are all presented. Everybody has an opportunity to see it before the council votes on it. Okay, thank you. Please say no to this. Okay. Mario and Martin, 21 Massachusetts Boulevard in Portsmouth. I have a follow up to Jeannie Smith's um, question. I personally sent a public records request to the town asking for any information, um, documents, and so forth um, regarding uh, South Coast Mayflower. The response, I'm a little confused how you're saying there's no discussions and there's been no um, information exchange because the response I received back was. Um, from 2021 to the present, there's approximately 700 pages of documents that's going to take a town employee approximately 46 hours to assemble, redact information before they can provide it to me, and it's going to cost me approximately $700. <laughs> um, so I think you can understand um, myself and as a prior speaker, Mr. Kraft said, we feel that there have been things done in secret. It's not open to the public. And when things are performed in such a manner, it raises a level of suspicion. If this is such a good idea for Portsmouth, why is it being spoken about in executive session and not in town council meetings? And as you know, there were many of us in this audience who requested to be on the agenda for a town council meeting. And that's what prompted this workshop tonight. Um, so if you can answer my question, um, what does what those 700 pages entail? I, I don't exactly know what's in the 700 pages, but I can assure you if it's something that's a negotiation like any other contract that's an executive session, that's privileged to executive session, okay? And, that, and, and you said you're an attorney, so I think you know that there are certain things that are privileged. If and when I never said I was an attorney. I, you are an attorney though, correct? Yes. Because I think we've yes. I think I think I remember some history. <laughs> so, so anyway, anything that's I'm I'm gonna finish. Anything that's done before any final decisions are made, that stuff is made public. That stuff is made public. As I mentioned, with any other contract contract that the town enters into, it's voted on in public. That contract is provided. Okay. Let me just, uh, let me just finalize my point. I, I understand that the negotiation process. But you said my friend. I understand the negotiation process. However, we're, we've been consistently told nothing's going on. Nothing's going on. The town administrator himself said at the April 10th meeting, nothing going on, nothing to report. And there's 700 pages worth of documents, and this has been going on since 2021. And here we are at the tail end of 2021. We don't know what our town leadership is doing. We don't know where you are in the process. And I guess we want to know what you're thinking. Like, what you're thinking about the whole thing. Really? This is just a workshop. This is not a public hearing. There is no proposal that we need to make a decision on. What I'm thinking at this point may change down the road. So 
it, it really doesn't matter what I'm thinking. What we're here tonight is to discuss concerns from the citizens. We've heard some information. There is no host community agreement. OK, if there is a negotiation, it's that it's a negotiation. OK, and the, and obviously everybody could Google host community agreement and see what's in a host community agreement. They vary. They vary by projects. So there's no specific one stop shopping for a, home, a host community agreement. Nothing is in place when there is something any before any decision is made that will be made public. Um, so I just want to help clarify because I thought, and I may be wrong, that I heard two inconsistent statements made by Mr. Ma and made by you. He said there was one and only one meeting with staff, correct? It was approximately an hour. You said there have been multiple negotiations, plural. No, okay. I didn't say I, I multiple. Said, oh, to, be okay. to, to be honest with okay. you, to be honest with you. We've, we've had executive session for discussion to update council when we had a new council but come South in. South Coast was not present. South Coast was not present at that. Okay. So that was a that was a fair that was okay. a an executive session where we updated new council members. Okay. There was no decisions made, there was no discussion, it was just information. Okay. <laughs> One of the things that I had requested going back over a year ago was documentation showing the cost benefit analysis of the Portsmouth route relative to other potential routes. Has that such information been shared with the town administration or the town council? Was it ever asked for? I'm not sure I recall. Ms. Arena? So, so you don't know if it's the least cost route, the most expensive route, who no, don't I know anything. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff, folks, is, and I think South Coast has, has already alluded to this, some of this stuff is being presented for the authorities, the regulatory authorities to review. Right. So routes may change, cost, I don't really know the specifics and all the details of, of what their application is. Yeah. I do know that you know, there's a there's a very large wind farm that was approved by in federal waters, which is outside of our jurisdiction. The routes that they are they're talking about are under the control of CRMC, EEM. Those are the those are the agencies, the regulatory authorities. Those are the experts that will be reviewing and weighing in on this. And then so ultimately, given, so that's, OK, that's fair. They haven't given you any proprietary information on that that is being redacted prior to um, providing it to um, the request that was put they're, they're not they haven't given you any any information that's not publicly known in any of those documents not, not that i'm aware not of. that you're aware of. okay I, I mean not that i'm aware of I, I i believe the information that was that's on file that we have on the website and, is, and, is, and, is and the you, project and the okay. routes. And, and do you believe that any, any information that's shared with town administration or town council on the project should be made available to the town citizens and residents? Do you believe that's the case? Yes. It, the, the answer is yes, unless it's done in executive session. And then but we've got if, if something's in executive session, that's that's a different story. That's something that's proprietary. And it's usually identified as part of executive session. So if they give you proprietary information and they say, use this as the basis of your information, but don't share it with the town council. You're, you're getting into hypotheticals. That is, I'm not going to discuss what happens in executive session on any, on any, for anything <laughs> that's executive session. That's what it's for. Mr. Ma. Joe had a good question, so I wanted to make sure I was clear about it. We Any information uh, that we have shared with the town staff has been the same public information we have same, uh, shared with you. I'm Sal Carceller, 63 Leach Road. Um, I have a couple of questions. What's our um, town yearly budget? Roughly. The what is it? Six. What was it? Seventy million. Seventy million. Okay. Oh, no. oh my God. How much have we spent so far of town taxpayer dollars on this initiative? None. Zero. 
None. Zero. I've seen checks paid out to attorneys. It's 100% true. Money is given by any entity that is looking to do a project to pay for the town or any town to be able to do research such as environmental studies or legal. They, South Coast Wind, well, at that point, Mayflower gave money to the town in order to be able to do those researches. If you see checks written, that's where the money came from. No taxpayer money has been used to fund any research on this project. Okay, how much has been spent? I don't know. I'll stop right now. Who backs South Coast Energy? Shell oil. Who owns subsidiary of Shell? Yeah. Okay. Half of us. That's a $300 billion a year. We're $60 million. Budget, yearly budget. We're being picked on. We were chosen carefully. Let's not forget that. So, is South Coast a private company or a public utilities company? I just want to ask questions. I want to grab, I want to know what, what, we're, up, what, what we're dealing with. Are you publicly owned or are you a public utilities company? We are not a public. Uh, we, South Coast Wind is a 50 50 joint venture between Shell uh, and Ocean Winds, which is a joint venture itself between a group called EDPR and MG. And South Coast Wind operates under its own board of directors. We are ourselves a, a private entity. We are not a utilities company. We have nothing to do with the normal, such as Rhode Island Energy or any of those uh, entities. Okay, so I'm going to assume that they do not have the privileges in Rhode Island of being an energy company and being treated as such. We should assume that that's the case. I would hope the town of Portsmouth recognizes that. Now, I want to ask a very pointed question, and I'd love to get the answer. I just want to know, are we dealing with federal, uh, a federal domain by which they're going to take this by enemy domain? Has that come up in any conversation with the town council? Federal eminent domain? No. No. Okay. If we proceed, and I'm not saying we should, I don't know. I'm just trying to get a gather. What is Portsmouth considering to do with the land that we're going to allow for these cables to come to? Will we sell or will we lease? Or will we not be compensated at all. Well, first of all, we don't know the final route, but I think what you heard earlier was it's under private property. Okay, it's under private. It's not, to my knowledge, not under any residential property. It, it's under um, private property. It's along a state road. Boyd's Lane, so Park Ave, Boyd's Lane, Anthony Road. A portion of Anthony Road to the, I believe the DP, the state, the former state barracks there is all state controlled land. It's okay. not that it's not controlled by the town of Portsmouth. So that's what I wanted to know. So that 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 answers the question. So they will not we we they're not considering going under any parcels of land owned by the town of Portsmouth. A, a potential option of a route is if it continues down Boyd's Lane. I mean Anthony Road a little bit further. And, and makes a separate crossing. There's I have two locations at Montauk Country Club. So depending on what route, one may be in a town right of way, one may not. So again. <laughs> okay. I keep hearing the term submerged land lease. I'm actually somewhat familiar with it because I actually had the lease, the full lease for the federal government's lease Department of Interior Bureau of Ocean Energy Management commercial lease for submerged land of renewable energy signed between Mayflower Wind LLC and the federal government in the tune of an acquisition fee of $135 million. This contract was signed on April 1st, 2019. That's just to hold the land to put the windmills on. The contract goes into a lot more has provisions, I don't know what the final, when this wind farm comes to full, I, I just want to understand when wind farms at full capacity, 
there's mathematical formulas in this contract that stipulate that you will pay the federal government for that land based on how much energy, how many turbines you put up. Do you have any idea what the yearly cost to lease that land is going to be when you are at full capacity? Um, so we're not able to estimate that number right now, mainly because we haven't selected our wind turbine technology yet. So right now we're estimating an energy generation potential of 2,400 megawatts, um, but that depends on what size megawatt turbine we ultimately end up purchasing. Um, in the original you know, um, point that you made, that, that's correct. We do have to pay a one-time fee to the federal government in order to lease um, the predetermined area of the ocean for the lease area. So can you give us, on that 2,400 megawatts, what do you think you would pay the federal government yearly? I can't give an estimate right okay. now. You can't, okay. I'm gonna venture to guess from the mathematics that it's quickly hundreds of millions. So now my question is, submerged land lease. If it goes to Portsmouth, I'm not saying it should. I'm just here to ask questions, right? I think we should have a significant chunk of a lease, if that's even to occur. But I'm going to warn you that you're dealing with a bohemian, and you better have the best lawyers in the entire country to negotiate this. I actually contend that maybe you should find out who the lawyers were who wrote this contract for the federal government and hire them to write our contract. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom McGree, 110 Third Drive. At first, this may seem to be a little off topic, but I ask your indulgence and everybody's indulgence because I assure you, you will find my comments pertinent. I'm a civilian member of the Naval Restoration Advisory Board, or RAD. The board reviews and advises Naval Station Newport environmental on environmental restoration projects. We met a week ago yesterday. I have the 68 page presentation we received. The project was the restoration of the offshore portion of the old skeet shooting range on Narragansett Bay, just south of Weaver Cove. It was used by Navy personnel in the early 60s to late 80s. <clears throat> the primary project concern was lead shot in the sediment. It is an environmental problem because it gets ingested by aquatic birds and bottom-dwelling sea creatures. The area is only about 3.5 acres. More than 50 core samples were taken throughout the area. The cores were screened for lead pellets and other hazardous pollution. High concentrations of lead pellets were found between one and four feet deep but PCBs and manganese at hazardous levels were also found. In consultation with EPA, DEM, CRMC, and the RAB, the best remediation was determined to be the, to dredge the area between one and four feet, depending upon the sample data. Turbidity curtains were required around the site to keep sediment from drifting off site. Monitoring equipment will be required outside the curtains to alert the project if any sediment does escape. The 41,000 tons of dried sediment will be hauled to a licensed hazardous waste site. That will be over 1,000 trips for 40 ton trucks. 40 tons is the weight limit for our bridges. The area will then be retested with another set of core samples to be sure it, is, it has been remediated. If not, the process is repeated. Once remediated, clean rocks, sand, and sediment will cap the site to restore the original, the original contours. Here's where we get pertinent. That is how a project should be run. <clears throat> Compare the Navy's care and precision to South Coast plan to put cables up the Sakana. Minimal pretesting to see 
what is in the sediment that they may be disturbing. Just hydrogenic uh, trench, eight to 10 feet deep, 10 to 12 miles long, and no one seems to know how wide. I can't find that out. No turbidity curtains to retain the sediment from spreading and creating problems. Just ever ask everyone to have faith the sediment will fall back into the trench and will not release any unknown hazards, hazardous pollution. With the high currents in the Sakai, I'm not sure turbid turbidity curtains could even work effectively. Is there any question why the Navy said no to having these cables put in these passage near their properties? I will leave it to others to speak to the trenching up waste lane near the landfill and the wetlands. The ski range is in type four waters, which are multi-use, basically moderately clean. The Sakonet is type one conservation waters and type two light use waters, the cleanest waters in Rhode Island. Where Revolution Wind, a Rhode Island project, comes into land at Quonset, it is in type six waters, industrial. South Coast is doing a Massachusetts project. Massachusetts is buying all their electricity, not Rhode Island. Of course, South Coast, as a Massachusetts project, cannot come into Quonset as they need a Massachusetts delivery site. That was Stalmus until Stalmus said no. Portsmouth needs to, to ask South Coast to choose a different place to deliver than Braden Point or a different way to come ashore and get there unless South Coast can prove beyond a reasonable doubt using a real plan that they and the other wind companies which will surely follow them will not injure our pristine Sakonic waters and vital marine habitat. I know what a plan should look like. So far, I have seen nothing that shows South Coast as such a plan to truly protect our environment. I do have one question for, for um, South Coast. Um, on your, I believe it was your second to last slide, you show that you need a Portsmouth approval or permit. What do you need Portsmouth approval for? That's a good question. I think it's noisy. Mm. Um, so most of the local approvals are smaller permits, like street opening permits, um, you know, things to do survey work in town um, and smaller things like that. Through the um, Rhode Island DEM and CRMC process, the town will provide advisory opinions through a six month period, um, which will go into consideration through those state agencies. So that's how they're involved in the process. Hi, um, my name is Tina Munter. I live at 26 Johnson Ave, and I'd like to thank the Town Council and South Coast Wind um, for hoping for hosting this workshop. Um, I'd also like to speak in support of offshore wind. Um, I know that's unpopular, and I am not a fisherman nor am I a business owner. And so I understand that I don't have the same experiences as other people. But I would like to say that we really can't wait on acting for climate change because if we do, it will be too late. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers in the PowerPoint, but South Coast Wind to demonstrate that the offshore wind development will reduce the amount of natural gas plants we have running and burning natural gas and oil in the country. And that's a good thing. We'll be burning less fossil fuels and emitting less CO2 into our environment. Um, if we don't build offshore wind or other renewable technologies, we will have those natural gas plants being built. And while they're not being built in Rhode Island, they are being built in locations that are affecting some of our most vulnerable populations, low income communities, minority communities, and I'm sure they don't want those either. I understand, or I can 
see and try to understand the sides of those that don't want these turbines and cables being laid in their historical and ancestral waters. Um, and I think that's totally valid and we need the accurate science and research to support all of our stakeholders, not just the offshore wind companies or host companies, but I at least ask you to please try and consider the other side and read the documents you've been given or what you're finding online. The Climate and Development Lab out of Brown University uh, did release a paper on theories of discourse um, in anti-offshore wind groups. Um, Green Oceans is one of them. Please look for cherry picking, conspiracy theories, um, denial in the topics that you're reading. Okay, hold on, folks. Listen, allow the speakers. You know, when when folks were speaking, you you let them speak. Please let her speak. I think it's important to read as much information as you can. Uh, being widely read is something to pride anyone's self on, um, but be open-minded as you're reading. Um, and read things that go against your baseline opinions. And again, just please consider if you don't build it here because you don't want to be affected, where will we build things and who else will be affected? Because we have on land refineries and natural gas plants that are burning down south, um, giving children and adults higher rates of cancer and respiratory illnesses like asthma that are higher than anywhere else in the country. Um, and those are directly linked to natural gas plants versus a cleaner energy source like renewable um, offshore wind. And that's not to say that development of offshore wind won't have its own carbon emissions associated with it, but those emissions are significantly less than those associated with fossil fuels. And offshore wind development may not mean a cleaner or more efficient future to you, but it does to me and it does to those who will be inheriting Rhode Island and who will be inheriting the country and the world and the natural resources as we're deciding on them right now. So I don't believe we're making decisions for ourselves right now. We're making them for your children and for your grandchildren. And you're making them also for the animals. Um, I know a lot of people have said that um, the construction of the cables will impact marine animals. And that I don't think is anything that's being contested, but you can look to the numerous um, oil refineries that are in the ocean. We just don't happen to see them. And those are drilling right into the core of our earth um, and disturbing who knows how many organisms. And that's all because we really don't see it happening. Um, yes, these turbines will be in our backyard and maybe that's why we're considering them more, but think of the energy sources you are comfortable with. And I ask you to think of why you're comfortable with them. Is it because they just weren't built when you were around to see them and they're you're used to them. Um, I know that offshore wind and renewable resources are scary and that's probably just because we're not used to them. So thank you again to South Coast and the town council for hosting this and just please listen to all sides as you go through your own decision-making processes. Good evening. My name is Chris Thompson. I live on Anthony Road in Common Fence Point. Thank you so long to be part of this democratic process. Usually, if I waited this, to, this long to speak at my age, I've forgotten what I was going to say. But, um, I want to just focus on one specific uh, angle of this, and that is the estimated employment impacts. Now, my qualifications for questioning those are that I developed the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a federal agency. I developed their employment estimation methodology for large projects. That's a methodology that's now used in 72 different extension centers around the country. Now, we had a presentation, I think, in March from the South Coast people at the community center in Conference Point, and they come up with a figure of 8,500 jobs resulting from this project. And they asked at the time, do you have any studies that we can see that show that? Which industries are gonna benefit? What are the direct, indirect, and induced impacts? And they said, well, no, we don't, but we'll get some. They said, we're going to have some management consultants do those studies for us. All right, fast forward two months to the publication of that race and scintillating document, the draft environmental impact statement, 730 pages long. I don't recommend you look at it at home unless you have the appropriate safety gear on. <laughs> if you go to section 3.6.3, you will indeed find a discussion of employment impacts. But they're quoting from a, a group called AWEA. Who is AWEA, I hear you ask? 
Who is Who it? Who are they? The American Wind Energy Association, an industry trade and lobbying group for the wind industry. <laughs> All right. Oh, I have forgotten the most I was going to say. <laughs> so, so I just recommend, I'm not making any judgment on any other aspects of this project. I just recommend that you throw those uh, estimates to one side until they actually come up with some independently generated econometric studies. One of the things that we found this is the outcome of these studies is very sensitive to is your estimation of something called the regional purchase coefficient, the RPC, which is basically what percent of the project's materials are going to be sourced globally. All right, well, I may be wrong, but I don't think a global corporation the size of Shell is going to be sourcing the materials of Ace Hardware. Nothing against Ace Hardware, I know that you turn myself. Ace is the place. I go there, I don't think Shell will. So I just ask you to apply a critical eye to those impacts and throw them out until they can be independently verified. Thank you. Quick point of clarification on that. Um, we do now have a publicly available um, independent um, economic analysis study. It was done by BBG Associates, who is an independent contractor. Um, anyone interested in, in seeing that report is welcome to email us or it, it's, it's available. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Kyle Fenton. I'm from 71 Kanaja Drive in Portland. Um, first of all, I actually wanted to thank everyone for coming out here, South Coast Wind, the town council, and the public. As, as most of you know, that this is, this is an important project. You know, this is, you know, you have to know kind of like um, what, what's going on and have like real understandable facts, you know? And, um, and, and, when, when you, and when you generate those facts, you want to make sure that you're getting them from reliable sources, that we get them from, you know, from other projects like in Europe, you know, and, and uh, scientists and stuff like that. You know, um, one of the things I've seen, especially over the last couple of months, has definitely been a lot of mis a lot of misinformation. And I just wanted to, just to I understand this is a very controversial subject. And you know, and again, we, we always want to make sure that whatever our opinion is about, it's based upon facts and not folklore. Um, one thing I actually I do want just to mention that actually most people probably don't even know is that you know everyone talks about the impacts of the electric cable. Most people don't know this, but we actually have three electric cables here on the islands. We have one from Melville to Prudence Island, so that's number one, and from uh, so we have two from Fort Adams. One goes to Fort Adams to Goat Islands, and the other one goes from Fort Adams to Jamestown, and those those powers those islands as well. And our and our um, electricity comes over the old Sakana Rail Bridge, um, you know, from you know Tiverton or whatever, and so on and so forth. So basically, you know, again, you have to, you know, when we're making, when we're trying to figure out what's the impact, we get to take a look at what's already there, you know. So we should take a look at making sure that we, you know, what's the impact of the cables over the decades, you know, you know, take a look at those studies, you know, and so on and so forth. And uh, I just want to just want to just you know I'll close out saying that well, I, I definitely, you know, I support this wind project, and I do it because. Um, you know, I, I feel for the future. I understand that there will be impacts. I, you know, I totally understand that. But we have to also make sure that, you know, our, you know, our, the future, our kids, you know, are, is, is able to be able to afford electricity. Because right now, um, ISO New England has, you know, for about, you know, five or 10 years now, has issued dire statements saying that we're, we're running out of electricity. You know, we, you know, there's, you know, they've done a lot of things to balance the load and do other stuff. But, you know, but the, you know, at the end, we eventually need more electricity. We're, our population is going to grow. Um, people are going to have more EVs. So there is, you know, there's also, uh, um, you know, there's also, uh, if, if you do nothing, then that also will be a problem as well. You know, because again, if electricity is, so, if, if electricity cost becomes so high, then people will move. And that's just, you know, we lose businesses, we'll lose population. And I definitely don't want that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, elected council members and entire congregation. My name is Denise Betts. I live at 113 Windward Drive in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I've actually lived in Portsmouth for over 30 years, and I chose to stay here because it is beautiful. And I've, I've been a Rhode Island resident. I've been born in, in Rhode Island. However, just two years ago, we bought our home. Uh, we both retired, and we figured beautiful, perfect place to stay. Never 
in my wildest dreams that I would, I thought I would be standing here in front of council members pleading with them to please not do something that would damage the reputation of, and the integrity of our entire island. Now, I'm not a marine biologist. I don't have a college degree. I'm not a fisherman. I am a resident. And as a resident, and I'm sure most of everyone here is also a resident. Now, if every single one of the people, I won't turn around and see who you are, but if you want to raise your hand, just to let them know that you are residents of Portsmouth. And if all these good people say to you, please don't do something, will you not do it? Or will you do it? Will you take a vote for us? Or will you, for some reason, whether it be monetary or publicity or who knows, political, do it because you think it's the best thing to do? Now, I'm sure everyone in Portsmouth remembers the fiasco of our very own uh, turbine in our backyard. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine 2000? I can't. Now, I am understanding that it will have two cables from South Coast. That's just for South Coast. Is there going to be two cables for everyone that goes out there? Was there eight or so? Um, developments out there? Are they all going to be allowed two cables? And if so, are they all going to take the same route? Which means this small little, I don't mean to say that it's insignificant, but the smaller intrusion upon our island will now be massive if everyone who goes out into the ocean and brings even just two cables. And every time that they dig into the ground, or pound into the ground, or lay a cable, is each and every company allowed the same amount of kills of about 700,000 animals? I'm just a lay person, and I'm listening at numbers, and I am frankly, I'm very impressed with the collective knowledge of the town. I applaud you. I am very, very, very impressed. They did their due diligence. Like I said, I'm just a resident, but um, please hear us and vote no. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Castleman. I'm at 365 Riverside Street. Three generations on Wigo Cove enjoying something that the rest of the world kind of pays for. I can't go to a beach in Massachusetts without paying big parking fees and entrance fees and credit fees for not being a Massachusetts resident. Good on the island park, what do you see? Well, you see a couple restaurants. They provide fresh food at a reasonable price. They're loved by the whole state. You go across the wall there, the beach doesn't cost anything. Every time I drive by, I would say on average, half the people who are parked down there are Massachusetts residents. I'm glad for Pete and Flo's and the ice cream shop because they're paying taxes in my state, not theirs. You move them forward, what do you see? Well, <laughs> We see are you doing the most pristine bodies of water in the world. I'm not saying that anecdotally because I live there. I've been fortunate. I've traveled to Europe. I've traveled to Asia. I've seen what power plants look like in China, in Japan, in Germany, in Italy, in France. I've been lucky. You don't know how lucky you are. What has happened to this town? I've been, like a lot of people here, in the unfortunate position of having come up with a microphone like this and argue a point which seems so ridiculously obvious. I won't plead for you. You should be pleading for us. What's happened in this town in the last 10, 15 years? I've seen many council members here who were here five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, fighting what? A toxic sandwich that's sitting between a beach, those two restaurants, residential housing, a playground at the end, next to an estuary, next to the crisping water of the ocean. It was ran through our town. Toxic waste from the Navy base was brought up there and dumped there. Toxic waste from a gas station in Massachusetts was dumped there. It continues to this day. We are living with a, a level of arsenic, it's five times, six times what the bud, and some of you know what that was, 
was allowed to be dumped there. We still have that there. My suspicion is in 20 years, when the ecologists and the hydrologists, and the people who have more knowledge than I do, are going to back and say, you know, what you guys did 20 years ago was dangerous. It should never have been done. And we're living with it every day. Just ask the people who have their houses on the first three or four streets there and had the dust tested on their windowsills when that project went in to see what the level of arsenic was in that dust. Now we're going to have this entity down there. What is that going to do? We've had expert testimony. I'm very impressed also at the level of people here who know what the heck they're talking about. That can't be ignored. You know, we still live in a free country. We're paid for that freedom. We pay for the right to vote. We got lots of examples of what that vote is supposed to mean. This is not just an ecological or geological or energy decision. This is also a political decision. For years and years, as most of the people know, we get hydroelectricity from Canada. There's so much power in Quebec Hydro, it would solve every single problem that we had in New England and New York, and probably Pennsylvania too. They have one-tenth the population we do. They love to sell us their hydro at spot market prices when we desperately need them. Over the years, many governors have tried to work together, collaborate, it doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat, to approach Canada, the tremendous resources of hydro up there. This is not a solution for a little bit of windy blades sitting off our coast, messing up our soil, getting nobody angry about what's here. This is a political decision that requires national attention. And not only do our two senators need to do this, but our representatives, town councils, and sometimes that has happened. This is not a decision for blades. This is a, this is a decision for a knife. It's to cut the cord of the big wind power companies and make a real deal with the people who have unlimited electrical power to ship to us and there's direct lines going over lands from Quebec to us right now. We just pay a lot more for it. Hello, my name is Donald Fleur. I live on 24 Cedar Avenue. That's what you gave me to do. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. Today. I didn't hear your name. I'm sorry. Donald Fleur. Thank you. 24 Cedar Avenue. So I'm here today because of my concern and opposition to the proposed cable coming down this kind of river. I lived here in the water's edge in Portsmouth all of my 64 years, specifically the cove in Island Park. For decades, the waters in this area, maybe I should put my glasses on. <laughs> for, de for decades, the water in this area in the East Bay, my whole day, this current river was polluted by the substation at Breaking Point, the tank farms in Tiverton, and a host of other sources. The water here, just past this cut of bridge going north, looked like root beer. In the wake of our boat, it looked just like root beer. It was so brown and polluted. Water would come up from the wake, you would see it. It looked like root beer. It has taken decades to get these waters here to be the cleanest they have ever been in my lifetime. And I believe that digging and dredging to install a cable down this comet could be devastating and undo all the work that has been done trying to clean it up by organizations such as Save the Bay. My fear is if they tap into the seabed, decades of legacy sediment, which can contain contaminants like cadmium, chromium, copper, lead, mercury, just to name a few, will again be dispersed throughout the river and taken into all the smaller waterways up and down the river, posing damage to natural habitats and polluting our fishing and shell fishing beds. <laughs> Fishing and shell fishing is a major priority in this area. Not to mention what these wind turbines will do out in the ocean to bird migrations, fish migrations and spawning, as well as the shark and whale migrations. There has been evidence that many whales have been beached on the shores of places like New York and New Jersey. There are also reports that scallop beds have been killed off as well. For many years now, the fishing industry has had to deal with so many regulations so that the fish populations retain their numbers, which has also forced many fishermen to leave the business because they can't absorb the costs of these regulations. But rich companies, many backed by large oil companies, 
can come into our little town like Portsmouth and take over our waterways and wreak havoc on our property with huge machinery, tearing up the town, and that is okay because it's green energy. How can it be green if it could have catastrophic consequences to our pristine waters? They say this cable could go down six feet in an effort to mitigate the effect of the electrical waves on fish and other sea creatures. But by doing so, you will surely be dredging up this legacy sediment and it will travel all over. The current in the Sakar River is very swift and the tides will take the sediment and spread it into every inlet and cove in the entire area, the length of the river. Even now, when we have a lot of rain, they close the shuttle fishing just because of the runoff. What is going to happen when they start this dredging? I really do not want to find out. Every action has a reaction, and the best made plans have paved the way to help. Please do not bring this help to our little town. Please do not allow the cable to come down this Connor River. Thank you very much. Hold on. I know you already spoke. But there's some folks who haven't had a chance. So I'd like to let everybody who hasn't. My name is Sharon Patton, 12 Fourth Street. I've attended two South Coast presentations at the Common Fence Hall and also the rally at Island Park Beach. After listening to representatives and guest speakers at both venues, I have major concerns cons um, regarding the cables coming down the Sakonic River. I believe this project will be a long undertaking and will impact local beachgoers, affect the traffic on Park Avenue, tied up Boyd's Lane, impacting, I mean, impact the exiting off of the Route 24, Jam Anthony Road, and back up traffic leading and exiting the Mount Hope Ridge. The cable construction will affect local businesses in Island Park and overall and the overall offshore wind turbines is likely to negatively impact our local fishermen and their livelihoods. Um, do you really think that anyone's really gonna eat the fish down in that area anymore after this is done? I am convinced that, I'm not convinced that anyone here has, will guarantee that that will ever be done in the near future. Um, speaking off on the turbines, I'm very concerned with the wildlife that migrate in the um, proposed area such as the varieties of seabirds and bats that are being harmed by the turbine blades. There are sizes of the football, of the football field. Um, some of you may not be aware, but as of 2022, in December, 23 dead whales have washed up the East Coast shores, according to the New, uh, sorry, according to the New York Times. I know you council members are only interested in the cables. However, there's a bigger picture. The cables come from a converter platform station that's out in the ocean, which are connected to the overly large turbines. The cables don't function alone. They go hand in hand. They are still, there are still a lot of unknowns in the documents from the Bone report, such as decommissioning plans, the impact of hurricanes, the shutdown of the turbines, and the boater and vessel restrictions. Um, I know that it was mentioned that a lot of documents are on the in the reports, but there are a lot of concerns because a lot of these documents are not published to us. Um, they're all hidden. So it makes everybody really concerned if those documents are, very, are hidden. Um, I, want, I go down to Island Park a lot with my grandchildren and I wanna to continue to do that. We ask that you council members vote no and don't do a host agreement or anything with South Coast. Let them go to Massachusetts. That's pretty much what this project is for. Hi, um, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Karen Gleason from 63 Massasoit. For full disclosure, I, yes, I am married to David Gleason. <laughs> and so far, the past few months, we're still together. 
I um, will reserve my comments um, in a minute. Right now, um, David Reese, who lives on Freeborn Street, was unable to come tonight and he had a letter and he asked me to read it. So uh, he also asked that it be placed on file in the records. So this is Dave speaking. My concern is the disturbing of the Sakonic seaboard silt in the path of the proposed cable lay. Hydro plowing disturbs the silt with high pressure water jets in order to bury the cable. The current sediment, the current sediment has basically remained undisturbed for hundreds of years. The silt at depth of the, of the dig contains pollutants from path bad practices or the sin of our fathers. Previous generations and power plants burn coal, which contain heavy metals and other pollutants. Coal is also burned by ships, homes, industries, such as all of those Oliver Mills and the Brayton Point power station. Locally, there used to be, believe it or not, a power station on Power Street in Portsmouth, close to Island Park Beach to power the trolley station. Disturbing the silt is just one kind of hazard. Shoreline population, sewage, storm drains, and hurricane debris would add to this. Have core samples been taken along the entire cable path and tested for hazards? I think Mr. Reese and maybe myself would be interested in seeing those geological uh, sediment studies that you mentioned earlier. Um, let's see. If this sediment resulting from cable lay will remain in suspension and coat our beaches, shellfish area, and agricultural sites. Those sites might be turned, actually closed down. This may pollute these sites and make items grown here not to be able to be safely sold for health reasons. The silt alone will destroy our beaches and clean swimming water. Island Park residents have put themselves in debt to comply with new septic requirements to ensure that our beaches and shellfish areas are not polluted. With no sampling or of testing of silt for toxins in the, and the fact that silt alone will follow our beaches, this is bad for Island Park. We face many hazards and unknown consequences for a cable firm, which we get no direct benefit. Mr. Reese is asking that you folks the town council reject this cable from being placed in Portsmouth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I took a few notes. I wasn't going to speak tonight. First of all, I am a resident and I pay taxes, as you know. Um, if we go past nine o'clock, I am going to beg you. That's to nine. Okay, great. <laughs> Fine. Because we were going to have a problem. <laughs> and, and really, this is a very serious, serious issue. I think that you've heard probably more from our audience, well, all those people that have spoken so far. I'm hoping that you've learned some things that you haven't known before. I'm surprised that some of you couldn't answer some of the questions regarding the document, 700 pages. You know, not really sure what's in that. Well, some of us, maybe more of us, have been reading a lot more material and information than you folks have admitted to. And I, I find that very, very disturbing. When I was on the council, I lost a lot of weekends. I'm not com complaining. I did a lot of reading, and I'm hoping that from this day forward, you guys can get going and start reading a lot because this is very, very serious. It's been very, very important, and it's going to cause, I believe, the extreme devastation out in not only in the ocean, the outer continental shelf, the fishing industry, but also Island Park Beach. And as someone mentioned before, the roads being torn up. And speaking of Anthony Road, which I happen to live close by, very concerned. I'm not really sure I'm going to be driving down Anthony Road anymore to get down to Conference Point if there are cables, 345,000 um, volts, high, high voltage cables. I'm a little nervous about that. And I'm wondering, 
Um, are you going to be digging up on the side of the road? So there's this beautiful trees going down Anthony Road, especially the part where after, well, the whole road actually, after the state-owned piece, because don't go in further than that, is I believe the town owns that road. And there's beautiful trees all along the Montauk Country Club. So if that's an option, I need for you to explain, what is that going to look like? Are you going to tear down trees? If so, are you going to replace them? Can I answer? Oh, yeah, I'm asking. <laughs> I want to make sure. That Thank you for the question. Uh, our intent would be to go on the south side right up against, uh, against Route 24. Oh. 24 doesn't have that much open land. Uh, to, to the side of 24 doesn't have that much open land. So what you're saying is you're really going to be digging up the road. That is going to be a disaster. So uh, let me add, uh, we're not cutting the trees. I concur with you. Anthony Road is beautiful and not on the north side, as you say, which is uh, untouched. So the idea is to stay on the south. The uh, trench uh, would be uh, 10, approximately four or five feet wide, four feet. So uh, through that four feet uh, can fit in uh, that area. And yes, we may pick up the, uh, what might be termed the shoulder there, a foot or two on that front, and then you repave it to the specification as determined by the town. All right, well, first of all, I'm not imagining this is even going to happen. So, if you haven't driven down Anthony Road, it's a very lengthy road, and I just can't imagine um, doing the south side, not the north side either, but um, it, that would be a disaster. You mentioned on one of your slides that there's millions of dollars to the state of Rhode Island. And did you say locally too? Millions of dollars are going to be going into the state of Rhode Island. And did you mention locally too? That was referring to the state of I'm sorry. Millions of dollars to the state of Rhode Island was referring to the submerged land lease to the state. Okay. So the land lease would be, would, is that including Anthony Road? No, it's, it's referring to state waters. Oh, the state waters. Okay, sorry. Hmm. So could I ask that during some type of negotiations, discussion, are you paying for digging up our roads? Who's paying for all of that? Well, we would be paying for the construction. The, the project is privately funded. And then if the project was to proceed, as mentioned, we would work to negotiate a host community agreement with the town. So when you mentioned millions of dollars to the state of Rhode Island, is there another million dollars that's being going to be offered to the town council? It, it, we're not going to have a discussion about negotiating and this is a workshop and I think you know that. So, I mean, come on, let's, let's just try to get to the facts. If you have questions, that's fine. But we already said, we're not gonna negotiate. There's nothing in a, in a formal host community agreement. So, you know, the questions are, I know you're trying to fish for an answer. There is no agreement. There's been no monetary value placed. I know you on have anything. not signed. You said that already that you have not signed an agreement. Just trying to understand. This is even a draft. Um, they're going to pay for digging up the road, but essentially, they, they we, would pay for. They would be responsible for all of the construction, right. whether it's in townland, state land. Right. They would be responsible for that. I, I mean, it, it's not the town's responsibility or or the state's responsibility. They, as the the developer or the contractor, they would be responsible for all those costs. Okay, I do wanna show you one picture um, that I actually had blown up, and it's for you folks. And I know you're just concerned about the cables, but um, as you know, it's not just about the cables. So this picture is from a, uh, a local beach, not here exactly, but Somewhere out here, I forgot, I'm sorry. I made this picture a long time ago. Um, and it just shows what wind turbines look like together on a beach. Um, and we believe, 
some of us believe, that we're going to be able to see these turbines, if you want to call them fine, um, farms, fine. I call them factories. Um, it's not very pleasant to see. But on this picture, and I'll give it to you closely, um, there's no there's something that's missing, and that's all the uh, red lights that will be seen in the evening or sometimes during the daytime. So because of air traffic safety, et cetera. So while I'm showing the picture, could you, sir, get up and talk about how many lights would be seen, red lights could be seen across this horizon with, we're talking about, I know you're only doing 147 or 149, but 1,000 to 2,000 turbines, what that could look like. And on the turbine, there's different areas of the turbine that have lights. So it would be the top, the center, gearbox, I'm not really sure, but if you could talk to that, I would appreciate it. But that's a lot of lights. No, I'd be glad to. And I was trying to glance at your photo. Um, I was trying to recollect. That is, a, a, to me, if I can guess, because there's no uh, naming or description here, looks like a, a, one of the very early projects in Europe over 12, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, so they are much close, more closely spaced. So I just want to start with that. But I want to answer your question. That is an excellent question on that. Yeah, that, that's, from your, that's from your South Coast. Um, yeah, this is uh, visual. Appendix. What are your visual talking points? This is South Coast. Um, are you aware of this? So, so do we yeah. know what this is? You better address this one. Yeah. Do we know where that is? But South Coast in their phone re it was one of I the can address this in question. So I'm just to be clear, okay. um, this is from our visual impact analysis, which was done um, for both the islands of Martha's Vineyard and uh, Nantucket. Our offshore wind miles. project is more than 70 miles away from Portsmouth and is not visible from any area of Rhode Island. The only place where the turbines are slightly visible is the island of Nantucket. The closest point of the most northern port of, portion of the lease area is 23 miles from Nantucket. Um, you know, Nantucket does have a different stake in this process um, with BOEM because of that adverse impact on the V-shed. Um, but that is the only community that has an adverse impact when it comes to the V-shed. Again, you, you will not be able to see the turbines anywhere from Rhode Island. Um, in terms of the lighting, we will have an ADLS lighting system. Um, this is a, a standard lighting system for um, aircraft safety for these types of projects. The lights will not be on consistently. They come on if a plane drives over the turbines at a certain range, or again, if there's a problem with the aircraft so that they know the wind farm is there. Um, again, the, the lights will not be on all the time, only if an aircraft is flying over. We do have video simulations available on Bones website of a simulation of our wind farm and what these lights will look like from Nantucket, where you can see them um, if an aircraft was to fly over. Hi, I'm Barbara Potter. I live on Burnley Ave. My question is, why is going down on Island Park? Is it because of the money? Is it cheaper to come to Island Park and go around? Because you're coming from Mass. It just has to do with money. If you choose with you guys, to do it that way. So we consider, my name is Kelly Smith. I haven't spoken to the project yet. Um, when we do our route analysis, we consider 14 different combinations of onshore and offshore routes. And there's a whole host of factors that go into evaluating the routes. There's a full analysis of that that we submitted to various agencies. Bone has come up before, that's one. Another is the Energy Facility Siting Board for Rhode Island. So we do consider the length of the route, because that's a factor for the duration of construction. It's a factor for the duration of construction and um, the level of impacts you could be expected to see from our construction. For you guys, but for us. I hear what you're saying. There's a whole host of factors and costs yes. is the only one. I live in Isle Park, and I think it should stay natural. It's bad enough they put that arsenic there, and I walk my dog at 5 o'clock in the morning. They were only supposed to do it for so long. Years later, they're still sneaking in there, putting stuff in there. So another thing is, what happens if they break? They leave oil and anything else. A hurricane comes, and all that shit comes flying. I just want to clarify, there is no oil in the cables. There's no nothing leaking out of it. There's no 
lubricants, nothing in them. And what happens if the hurricane breaks the, uh, the, well, the turbine? Where's it going to come? Downstream. So, have a cable there. Um, again, no oil in it. No lubricant, nothing in them, none of them. Not even the turbines. Not the cable itself. Not even the yeah, turbines. The yeah. turbines are, are, are a different system, and I will say, you know, they break and they're going water. And they they're tested to be able to withstand category four or five hurricanes. I mean, as as most of us know, many of these wind farms. Hurricane yet? Maybe in some circumstances, but that's why we'll have an operations and maintenance ports and full operations and maintenance crews to be able to handle that if it was to happen. But have any of them broken in a hurricane yet? I'm sure that may have happened in Asia and Europe. I can't pull out any specific examples, but this turbine technology is, you know, it's tested to be able to withstand very, very strong storm surges, hurricanes at sea. I mean, we know that weather conditions and winds are yeah, stronger at sea. So this, this technology is tested for that. Yeah, but it's, that's always not a problem. Sometimes it doesn't go by that. Nature's going to do what it does. So I'm asking, please try to do that. Because I live down there. Bad enough, you guys are already like the arsenic in it. Who's going to make, how much money do you guys make about this? <laughs> You guys make big bucks, and we're we'll going to pay a price for it. I'm sorry, I don't believe you should get those. I live there, I'm born with app, and I think we should keep it natural for our grandkids and everybody to enjoy natural. None of the other stuff that can ruin it. So I'm asking you to vote no. Thank you. My name is Greg Weatherby. I met on 56 Taylor Road to get up with my voice. The, um, when I came here today, I thought I'd get three agreements. And I think that I did. What's, what's amazing to me is you're not in control of the blame. Okay? And a big part of that is with the time that I spent um, out on the water. The, Blades have to emit some kind of a flashing, you know, uh, flicker. A flicker. Stop every day when I drive past one, and at the light, that time of day, that intersection is flashing like crazy. And I can't imagine how any biologist, marine biologist, can think that in all of the square miles out there that are going to be covered in that flicker are going to dissuade wildlife from wind hanging out. You know, I wouldn't. And so far as people are concerned, there's probably some kind of a warning. You know, label for epilepsy. <laughs> um, but I've been living in 42 years, and I think it works with maybe 40 of that. And Throughout that time, I've seen the, a hurricane came through and eat uh, a dozen feet by the length of my property on the Sakana room. Eat it right up. CRMC, no way you can put that back. I said, that's fine. I'm not going to pay taxes on it, right? Well, that's up to the town. I had to pay taxes on that. It was gone, and I couldn't mow it. <laughs> I had rocks on it, and rows of pagosas, which would tell me when the fish would show up. But the, um, in the early 90s, I started a fishing business. In order to do that, in order to take people fly fishing from all over the world on the Sakana River, I had to get a cabin's license, which I should have gotten years before. But I got one. When I got the license, there were 9,000 possible questions they could ask you in order to give you a little piece of paper to take some poor guy from New York or wherever he's coming from, fish and to lower his heart rate and give him some peace. The Sakana has fishery that's mind blowing when you're out there as much as I've been out there in my life. There's stuff there you wouldn't think. There's highly migratory species. There's tuna that go in the Sakana River. Um, the, the wildlife is mind-blowing. And the thought of doing anything to disrupt that 
And believe me, I had no idea that the community had so much expertise in this. But when I came in today, I'm thinking, just slow down, right? Slow down because Einstein's always saying, you know, what questions haven't we asked ourselves yet? And Amen. I listened in on, I went into one of these webinars and the scientists, everybody's gracious, right? But the scientists were, were discussing the different levels of possible heat or anything that could come from the cables emitting and the effect it would have on wildlife and that they would be looking into that. How far down it goes, all that kind of stuff. I really had, I was into the, you know, the loss of the tuna grounds out there, which it will be a loss. But, I, and I couldn't get my head around that except politics and greed. But the idea of bringing a cable up the Sakana, disrupting all the sediment, which it dawned on me, um, has been flowing in there for years, would be devastating. And that the ocean state can hardly afford to take a light stance on what, you know, 400 miles of navigable coastline provide in terms of economy and community. And so just to go back to, you know, what questions have a chance yourself yet? I know if my wife were here, uh, she didn't want to come, she was afraid she'd start yelling. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to give up any great secret or anything, but I know that there's wildlife on the uh, west side of the little road you're going to go by that if we paint little white spots on them, it'll be protected. Um, and it's the only place we've seen these animals you know, on the island. I'm sure they're elsewhere, but it's the only place we've seen them. And the idea of grinding up you know, that road right there and displacing this, you know, it's just hard to imagine. So I'll leave you with this. Um, there isn't anything that I think man has thought was a good idea so far that's really worked out in the long haul. And if, if the wind farms offshore, if that's happened, and it's, you know, what happens, it's a shame. It's really a shame. If the, if the effects of that are felt down the road and are found to be so disruptive, right? Um, that's, that's on all of us for allowing it. But this is a really small piece of that puzzle. And you seem to have the ability to shut it down completely and have it no 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 we don't so not the blades but the cabling coming up the river that's the state so you're gathering info for the state no 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 we we we, we wanted to have a public hearing uh, a work workshop. workshop tonight there will be a public hearing at, at a point down the road um the the workshop was to get information out there and I and I there has been a tremendous amount of discussion tonight about the Sakana River. The Sakana River, any permits to do work in the Sakana River are controlled by CRMC, DEM, CRMC, DEM, and ultimately the I believe the ultimate decision is by the PUC. The PUC is gonna yes. make a decision as to whether or not this project moves forward. Who is it, the Public Utilities Commission. The Energy Facilities yeah, Siting EFS, Board? The EFSB. EFSB. Yeah, right. Which is so under PUC. How are you at this to allow it to cross through that little cut of port? If the, the a bulk of what our responsibility is, is, is what happens when it's on Portsmouth proper. If, if, it's, if, if it's approved by <laughs> yeah, the if state. If approved by the state and the other permitting. Yeah. Well, 
I, I just <laughs> I haven't heard what I heard here tonight. What I learned instead of just saying slow down and figure out what questions you need to ask yourself, it's just any chance you get to not allow that able to come up this time will be a benefit to future generations. Um, so in the Skana River, when you're swimming in the Skana River, you worry about nitrates now, right? Until the scientists were able to say that that cable coming up the middle of the Skana River isn't going to have an impact on life as we know it in the river or swimmers or anything else. I, I mean, that alone should be one reason to do that. But the, the benefit to future generations, yeah, and totally we understand we have to be very careful how we tread on the climate, et cetera. So, um, and it isn't about if, if not doing it in my backyard, but don't squash a pristine fishery, a pristine body of water that is taking decades to get that way. Um, you know, uh, giving it an inroad to then cross over, uh, you know, a little strip of land that's paradise to the people that live here. Oh. I, I just want to say, I mean, just want to let people know. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Take two oh. minutes. No, 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 I know, I know. No, I'm going to let you speak. Don't, but it's 935. Okay. So I know, I know, but I just want to say, Okay. These will be the last three speakers, and we'll try to get out of here. Okay. Oh, okay. Four, 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 four speakers. Okay. So we're going to try to wrap this up by 10 o'clock. That's another 25 minutes. Okay. Right. I just want to, I don't want to cut anybody off, but I want to, I mean, it, we're pushing 10 o'clock. So okay. I'll let you go. What's that? Can I see your watch for a minute? <laughs> on the computer. You can. I, I'll, I'll give it to you. But. Yeah, I commend you uh, yeah. for your tolerance. I have specific answers to some outstanding questions, which are, I think haven't been answered. First of all, wind towers are an interim solution to, as you know, the future is new fusion energy. People say that's going to come in 10 or 20 years. So wind towers are or interim solution. Uh, in terms of the uh, revenue, every lease owner, and I've crawled through the 30 or 40 BOM projects, they all have the same basic rules. They pay a lease fee, 135 million in the case of um, South Coast. There's an annual rental property lease of uh, $3 per acre regardless whether they find any uh, think of an oil analogy. So that's just the annual rental for the property. And in addition, they pay roughly 40 cents per kilowatt hours of energy they generate. So adding up those two numbers, it's roughly 382 million plus another couple hundred million annual for every, uh, for South Coast. The uh, other nine projects, uh, eight, I'm sorry, eight projects have simple, similar rules, but <clears throat> depending on their number of terminal turbines, they have the same pay loss. That's the end, don't That's, that's okay. <laughs> Lisa Kochaki Knight, 82A Lawrence Point Road. Little Compton. I'm not a Portsmouth resident, but I wanted to speak about two things. And one is I agree with the young woman who spoke earlier about the importance of trying to actually combat climate change. And I think if this mission were actually going to combat climate change, then I would be all for it. And we might be, well, not all for it, but we might be willing to overlook all of the environmental damage. However, I have some data that suggests that that's not the case. And I also want to point out that no place on any of the environmental impact statements do they ever say that they're going to help combat climate change, even if you take all of the projects together. And one of the reasons why they may say this is because Rhode Island has actually done a pretty good job. We've actually decreased our electricity consumption. And this is ISO New England data. Rhode Island has decreased its electricity consumption. 
It has also added quite a bit of wind power to the grid. So since 2013, we have 82.5 megawatts of wind power. Oddly enough, however, we've increased our emissions. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not a, a, an expert on the grid, but I have asked some experts, and one of the explanations they give is that the load mismatch makes the normal gas generated turbines actually um, run very inefficiently. The analogy I've been told is it's the difference between driving on the city and driving in the um, highway. You, your car runs less efficiently and you have more emissions. So wind might be a solution if we actually had adequate battery power to back up all the extra wind. Wind happens to generate a lot of electricity at night during the winter time when we oddly don't have our lights on and we're not actually using our, electric, our air conditioning. So until we get battery power, wind turbines and wind farms actually cause an increase in emissions. So therefore, under no circumstances are we doing anybody any good by, by um, allowing these projects to go forward. And I also agree with the whole idea that we're stewards of the earth. We don't own it, nobody does. We're stewards for the next generation. And we have to pay attention to data. We have to pay attention to facts and truth and not let for-profit industry try to you know, create a narrative that just isn't true. However, I also wanted to compliment South Coast Wind because they have actually, unlike Revolution Wind, which kept 25 of 51 technical reports confidential, where we could not even get them with a FOIA, South Coast has only kept five. <laughs> However, of those five, one important one is the air emissions data technical report. Why is that? So I'm asking the group from South Coast today, one, if they would please release the air emissions technical report and the other confidential appendix that they have kept completely secret is the economic development and benefits to Rhode Island. So that speaks to um, one of the gentlemen who spoke earlier about the, um, the fact that the job projections may not be quite right. I don't understand why they would keep that particular technical report confidential. So again, I'm asking the South Coast people if they could please release all five of the technical reports that are confidential. One of them is also the emergency response plan. So. At a point on the air emissions report. So for that one specifically, it's tied to the area. Sorry, thank you. So for, specifically for the air emissions report, there's some proprietary information related to assumptions about the vessels that are used. So industry standard vessels serving other parts of the world. Um, and so it has to do more with what those other contracted vessel owners would think of making that information public. It has to do with South Coast specifically. Just one more I, 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 I fail to think that that is an adequate explanation for not releasing information to the state that's going to be affected by this. Some of them that you were mentioned, um, I can't remember the specific ones off my head, but many of them just need to um, be 508 compliant, which is an accessibility requirement for BOEM. Um, so some of those reports, once we reach that compliancy with BOEM and BOEM posts that on their website, they, they will be available. Um, so sometimes it's just these regulatory requirement approvals that we need to reach sorry, um, to be able to, to release them. Well, I would like to believe that, but there are two problems with that answer. One is that we have actually done FOIAs and have not gotten any response from that. We know of a law firm who's tried to get uh, the technical reports released, and they've had a court order against them. And we also know that you're a for-profit company using federal land, which is land owned by the people. This is a country where it's for the people, of the people, by the people. 
and that um, you're getting tax subsidies as well. So the standard of keeping propriety and proprietal information secret should be much different under these circumstances. So considering where the state is going to be affected, I would really urge you all to release those reports. Uh, Mr. Just hold on one second. Those those documents would they be made available to the review agencies so that any time prior to a final decision from any of the review agencies, they would have access to to review all the information. Yes, that's true. Okay, I just I just wanted to make sure that so that there's not a misunderstanding. Maybe the documents aren't available right now. But through the review process, through the regulatory review process being conducted by the state, those documents should be made available at some point. And exactly. then and then that information could be provided. I, no, no, I'm just, I'm, I don't want to keep belaboring that. No, but the CRMC has already made its, its decision about it. I, I don't know if don't the CRMC has made it a final decision. Well, the Revolution Wind, it has, and we were never- That's, that's a separate, pro Re Revolution Wind is a separate project. Just one really quick. I just want to make it clear again, you know, we, we don't work, control all of those documents being released. As you mentioned, they're controlled for the regulatory review process. And as we progress through the, that process, reports will continue to be released. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rob Tady on Rod Avenue. I want to start with uh, the problem that we have here with electric could be solved by the government helping us all get solar panels on our homes. Now, I didn't do it earlier because there were too many restrictions, but I just found out from a neighbor, they got theirs put on, and the extra stuff they put back to the uh, uh, power companies, they get credit for it, and the credit stays there. So you can really reduce what your electric is, and there's no pollution. You don't have wind turbines. Put this stuff on your house, and if we could get grants to help us do this, I'd have them on my house right now. So we could actually take care of this with no problems. We wouldn't have to have things out in the ocean. So let's look into that. Another thing, a great point. That uh, emissions that came from there, they went in and redid the stacks and the emissions went way down. For years, as we drove by Brayton Point, all the trees had no green leaves on. After they redid the stacks, all the trees had green on them. That showed you the difference on the emissions. And down in New Orleans, there's a plant down there that redid their setup. And what they burn comes out the same as natural gas emissions, because all this can be done at power plants, but they're not doing it because they're not gonna make as much money as they can with this stuff. They're really going to take us to the laundry. And there's no reason for it because we can have power if we want. And uh, I don't know, they're, they're walking around the back of everything and not giving us answers. And by now, we should have got every answer we needed right here at this meeting because they've been doing this for this long. So something's got to be done about this. Thank you. I am the maybe the last person. Um, oh, there's a couple more. Uh, so I was going to say it was between, I'm between you and a big glass of wine. So I'll keep this really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that's what's happening to me. Um, so <laughs> my name is Constance Gee, and I'm honored to be here. I'm actually a lone person from. Westport, Massachusetts, the place that a couple of people keep saying that they should take the cables through the harbor and up 88. Well, I would just like to say that, you know, I hear you. And it seems to me that we as humans can never take seriously or pay attention to anything unless it's happening to us. And I want to say, Thanks to all of the people that have turned out to Portsmouth and have done their homework and have made some excellent points and presentations tonight. Thank you. You know, if you were going to take it through the harbor where I live and up 88, 
I bet you people in Westport might actually pay attention too. This is what it takes. I'm not inviting you to do that, by the way, but hey. <laughs> um, you know, if I wish, I'm not going to, uh, to talk about what I plan on talking tonight. I'm just going to make a couple, two quick points. And that is that the wind companies are for profit industry and they are going to make so much money off of this. Not just the wind companies themselves, but their, their parent their parent companies. Um, and they cannot, time and time again, we have learned that they cannot be trusted. Their word is not good. When they were giving, when the South Coast people right now were giving their uh, pre preliminary, their preamble, and they showed all of the different organizations that they had to get okay from, and they showed what studies they've done, really, for those of us who have been in this fight for a while now and have watched this process, we know that it goes very quickly and this is, and they want you to think it's a done deal. And it may be that all this has been done under cover of night for years now. And there's been so much money that exchanged hands and, you know, the communities are just finding out about it now that everything is ready to go. They talk about their fauna studies, fauna studies. When they showed that up there, I wanted to laugh out loud, except for that it's not funny. They've done very little fauna studies. They don't know how this, what they're going to do out in the ocean or up the Sakonet is going to impact all the different species. They have no idea. They don't know about migratory birds. The, the, the thousands of 900, close to 900 foot tall, turbines that are going to be installed, monopiles into the ocean floor from Massachusetts down to North Carolina are smack in the middle of the Atlantic flyway. Migratory birds and bats, the North Atlantic white well, all of the migratory species coming up in the, in the waters, they have no idea how any of this is going to impact. They, they have not done those studies. And one last thing, what, so the gentleman um, who asked about, so where did you get your numbers on job creation? And, and a young, the young lady jumped up and said, oh, we now have our independent study that was done. And, you know, so we have, and it's going to be great for, it's going to be great for the state, it's great for everybody. Um, and they cited, um, what was the name of it? BBG Associates. Well, look up BBG Associates. They've got a wind turbine for a logo. <laughs> All right, they're really independent, right? I mean, this, this is the kind of stuff that you hear. This is the kind of spin, pun intended, that you hear from the wind companies all the time. I won't say lies, I guess that would be rude. Um, here, here's a couple of their publications. The Clean Revolution, Building Northern Ireland's Offshore Wind Industry. Offshore Wind Roadmap for Abrajan. Offshore Wind Roadmap for the Philippines, and on and on. So this is their, their independent company that they hired to tell Rhode Islanders just how good it's going to be for you economically. Okay. All right. I, I just... I, it's Last comment. Oh, but there's how many people are online? <laughs> well, yeah, as I say, there's 50 questions oh. <laughs> online okay. that I have suggested that we can get answered and then publish on. All right. The so the so we're going to. There was one person online that has had their hand up since we started. All right. Can, so let me just take the person online. Then I'll come back. Oops, You'll be a little sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the two online. Start with Sarah. Hang on a second, Sarah. This, Sarah, this is the first I'm hearing of you being online. Sorry. <laughs> Good, Sarah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's actually not Sarah. That's my wife. This is Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> 
resident of Rhode Island, former resident of Portsmouth, but my business is still registered in Portsmouth, and I've been attempting to get a couple questions in all evening. My first question for the board would be Title 20. Under specific Rhode Island law, Title 20 must be adhered to during all undertakings to do with coastal waters and marine life within the state of Rhode Island. Has Title 20 been <coughs> during this procedure? Are you referring to CRMC jurisdiction? Title, no, Title 20 under Rhode Island state law, actually. Title 20 is specific to wildlife yeah. under and yeah, I, I mean, that. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not up on Title 20. Um, you should be. <laughs> come on. <laughs> well, you should be. You, you should be up on all of the current laws with your board. And this is this was a meeting tonight that was supposed to be done in an in a, in a informational manner. And quite frankly, that's lacking information. So, so my second a, question, a shot, sir. I'm, so I'm my sorry. Second, well, that was for the that was actually for the wind people, not specifically for the board. Somebody there from the wind farm could answer this. Well, I, but I was the one that you were answering. I said I didn't know about Title 20. You said I should. So I'm, I'm just responding. Well, well I, I think we all, I think everybody there should agree. And, and you yourself would agree that an informed board member would know about Title 20, which is Rhode Island state law. OK, you got me. But, All but right, you, I got you. you I got, got you on that one. Let's we'll move on to, to my next question. Yeah, okay, let's let's move on to that question to the for the to the wind lady. Let's let the wind girl stand up. Wind lady. <laughs> All right, let's let's try to be a little be, be respectful. Well, I, I, I don't know her name. I'm sorry that I don't know her name, but she is obviously a representative of the the wind folks from South Coast. Let's let the South Coast representative stand up. Is that better? Yes. What, what's your question? Has Title 20 under Fish and Wildlife and Rhode Island state law been even addressed or adhered to during this permitting process? I'm Erin Healy, I'm on the permitting team for South Coast. You gotta just speak into it a little Aaron louder. Erin Healy, permitting team for South Coast. We're going through the CRMC review, which I think is under Title 20, and mm -hmm. also DEM. So someone just mentioned that that was a done deal, it's not. We'll be saying more um, coming through CMC and including documents coming out for, for public comment. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. So my second point that I've been trying to get along all night is the, the environmental impact studies that were referenced several times by other speakers. Has there been an environmental impact study specific to Rhode Island waters? It's not called an environmental impact statement or an EIR like it is in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. It's called the ascent. And again, it's the same process through CRMC. DEM will also have a permit process and that is for water quality certificate and dredge. So no environmental impact study has been done. Is that your answer? Environmental impacts are in included in both of those documents. No, they're not. I've gone through 972 pages over the last two weeks of my life. There is no environmental impact study federally or locally. Yes, there's environmental impact statement that is um, right now is in the draft phase and it's available on the BOEM website. It's also available on um, the South Coast Bowl website. The ascent application that's, that is specific to Rhode Island waters has not been released because CRMC is currently reviewing it. It will be released soon. Okay, so it's not. So the answer is no. And, and then my last and final point to make as, as a person who's impacted greatly by the cable, Rock Island is by definition an experimental array of five wind turbines. The cable repairs have been shouldered by the ratepayers to the tune of $30 million. The farm was shut down in June of 2021 and four out of five were determined to have stress factors similar to the known problems in Germany off the Merker Sea. Currently, the U.S. Coast Guard has published an informational post to all mariners determining a 60-day repair period to that same array to go through August of this year. Is it true that one will be replaced rather than repaired after its short life of just 6.5 years? Yes. Uh, I am not familiar with the Block Island. I don't represent the operator there. That is another group. So uh, we'll have to find another source 
uh, to answer that question. I do want to highlight that the cable that's been referenced several times this evening of the Block Island wind farm when it comes ashore, interestingly, was trenched versus what we believe is a much more proper method, which is a horizontal directional drilling so that you're not putting something on the surface of the beach. It should, as we showed, be way under the beach because no person should stand on a cable or have any impacts with that. I'd also highlight that that was a uh, cable project was done by a utility, which does have, uh, if I may, access to repairs, not a private company, which would be fully responsible itself. Okay, so were the repairs shouldered to the rate payer, not the taxpayer, the rate payer? I just uh, was trying to reference that the, those were- Well, you were referencing the, it. So if you're going to reference it, then you should have some answers to what you're referencing. Okay, then I'll be very specific. Uh, I am telling you that the cable of that portion of the project was done through a utility. You, sir, um, are aware of utility rules versus private company rules. I don't have any more details than that. Convenient answer. Have a good night, folks. Thank you for hearing me. Um, Amanda, Amanda Barker. Amanda Parker. Amanda Barker, yes. Parker. Amanda Barker. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Amanda Barker. I live at 188 Valley Street in Providence, and I am the Rhode Island Policy Advocate at Green Energy Consumers Alliance, as well as the Rhode Island State Lead for the New England for Offshore Wind Coalition. We are a coalition of environmental, academic, labor, business, and social justice organizations united by our vision to combat climate change and increase the supply of clean energy to New England through responsibly developed offshore wind. We believe that offshore wind is the biggest lever that we can pull to meet our energy needs, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and address the climate crisis, all while creating local jobs and benefiting the economy. It will allow us to transition away from fossil fuel energy, which not only emits pollution, but threatens our grid reliability and increases energy costs. Our state and region's reliance on fossil fuels leaves us vulnerable to market volatility and price spikes that are inherent with oil and natural gas. South Coast will power more than a million homes across the region and eliminate more than 4 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. That's 4 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. This is essential to combating climate change. In addition to these energy and environmental benefits, South Coast wind will also serve as a key driver of jobs, economic growth, and investment here in New England. Concerning fisheries impacts and marine life impacts, we understand that there are temporary impacts during construction and the coalition strongly advocates for mitigation measures and fisheries compensation packages. But I want to underscore that we advocate for offshore wind because we have to. Because saying no to offshore wind is saying yes to natural gas plants polluting the air we breathe. Natural gas emits various air pollutants such as nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxides, particulate matter, and volatile organic compounds that contribute to respiratory problems and cardiovascular concerns. These plants are often cited in low-income communities and communities of color. So we really need to ask ourselves what we're asking others to bear in order to avoid short-term disruptions from this project. Saying no to offshore wind is also saying yes to building more gas pipelines which leak methane and pose a serious hazard to human health. Whereas the construction of this cable will again only cause minor disruptions and is a small price to pay for the tangible long-term benefits that offshore wind projects like South Coast will provide. Saying no to offshore wind is saying yes to catastrophic impacts of climate change, including warming oceans and acidification, which will have a profound impact on marine life. So yes, impacts must be mitigated. Fisheries must be compensated for construction time, but we can develop offshore wind in a responsible way that respects our environment and our wildlife. We don't need to choose between offshore wind and wildlife protection. We can do both, and in doing both, we're protecting wildlife from the greatest threat of all, which is climate change. We cannot forget that we are in a climate crisis. The latest IPCC report called for urgent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions 
to avoid catastrophic impacts of climate change. We urge the Council to support this project as offshore wind is crucial to addressing the climate crisis, meeting New England's energy needs, and creating local jobs that grow our economy. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next, sir. Sir. I'm a foreigner from across the bridge in Bristol, uh, Patrick Barash, a geologist. Um, I want to make just a few comments about the geologic situation that might be taken into consideration. Uh, retired from the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, worked around in this region, and I did a uh, director of a major program for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on uh, the faults and the seismic hazard in the Northeast with follow-up studies for the Corps of Engineers. And we did particular work on the Sakata River in part of that. That we had uh, surveys done for the bedrock and uh, the top of the uh, loose material, glacial material above that, and uh, on the faulting around that the, uh, and also uh, considerable ones in Mount Hope Bay, which go on. Now, um, Rhode Island is a seismic active area, not like California, uh, of course, but it has as many faults, or so maybe more than California does and some uh, larger ones even. And the Sakata River is on an active fault zone. Um, we have actually one of our best illustrations around here of the youngest faults in New England. And they're still active places. There's probably about two earthquakes, uh, uh, well, earthquake every two years in Mount Sakata River. They don't record a lot of them. But these, they're most of them are tiny earthquakes, um, but they're very shallow, so they could create damage, or even ones that wouldn't be noticed in, elsewhere. So this means really you have a, a very complex uh, geologic environment to in here. The one uh, one of the faults goes from. Uh, think of a line through Tiverton Four Corners to Boyd's Lake. That's what the ends of the high land in uh, Portsmouth through in there. And it, in 2002, there was an earthquake along and in the middle of the Sakata River through in here. But there could be more around. There are uh, just scattered all around in, in the area. It's surprising. I felt the one, uh, uh, the effects of that earthquake continue northwest. It continues on the, the zone up through uh, Bristol Harbor. And well, I've heard, I felt the 2002 earthquake when I was in Barrington in the morning. But you've got this complex faulting through the area. You've got the bedrock below the Sakata River that comes up steep in places close to the surface, drops down. The, I could see even trying to trench, there could be possibilities of running into bedrock in the trenching. And then you've got this uh, loose surface material that's going to shift as the offshore ones here. Uh, the dunes are notorious for shifting causing all the uh, shipwrecks. But in the Sakata, you can un uncover the cables easy in a hurricane with the soft material slipped around. But these are all things that have to be considered uh, in the situation, not in the Sakata, but a continuation across Mount Hope Bay. But uh, the whole project offshore, though, 
makes little sense when you consider the amount of energy uh, available in Quebec Hydro. That just needs a connection to the New England network. And uh, it would cause no additional problems. Thank you. I know. I think there's three more now. I know. Oh, okay, let's keep it moving. <laughs> Sorry to rush you, but I mean, now we're, we're at 10 10. <laughs> Um, <laughs> right. So it, I would like to, I, I've given everybody an opportunity. So I'd like you to just be brief at, at the end here. This again is a workshop. There's still more to follow. So this will be at last three, right? One, two, three. Hi. Um, I'm Charlotte Duhamel, D-H-A-M-E-L. I live at 581 West Main Road in Wilcompton. And thanks for holding this event. And you guys have all said so many really important things about the benefits and cost of offshore wind. I think it's also important to think about who the partners are here. And do you want a partner? Who do you want a partner with? Have you heard about what's happening in the Niger Delta? What happened there? 13,500 residents have filed suit. Shell oil has been there for 60 years. They're pulling out. They're not cleaning up. Most likely this won't be an oil situation, but if you think about who's going to be there when problems arise. More than 13,500 residents I filed claims against Shell asking the company to clean up oil spills, which they say wrecked their livelihoods, poisoned their wells, polluted their lands and water, which means they can no longer for farm or fish. According to Amnesty International, they stand by these communities, which have been gated in litigation with Shell for years, asking the company to clean up the damage caused and compensate them for their lost livelihoods. So a company that's earning $200 billion market cap, I think they'd be good partners. Thank you. Uh, Gary Meadows from uh, Sakata Point. So I'm in the thick of everything down there. I've also been on the town council in Little Compton for 25 years. Uh, I think you all know that uh, the town uh, Little Compton made a resolution. The resolution reads, whereas the town of Copper is bounded on its long western shore entirely by the Sakana River, whereas the Sakana River is home to a wide variety of fish and shellfish, with virtually no industrial development on its shoreline, and whereas the entirety of the river is used year-round for commercial and recreation fishing, as well as recreation boating, and whereas this installation in the river for high fire I power electro transmission cables from offshore wind turbines, which subjects its ecosystem to unpredictable risk and damage. Whereas the intended destination of the cables and beneficiary of the revenues and their electricity produces is a power plant in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <laughs> Whereas an alternative overland path with fewer attendant drawbacks has not been sufficient to support, therefore be resolved. That the Little Compton Town Council supports the exploration of a cable path alongside State Route 88 in West Point, Massachusetts, which would carry none of the attendant risk of the current plan and traverses an area relatively free of private residents or businesses. Voted this night there, February 2023, by the Little Compton Town Council. Uh, I think you probably know also that the town of Little Compton was an intervener for. Um, a lawsuit against South Coast. Um, so I was asked to come up with some questions for the lawyer that we hired. And some of them were we the fishermen are very concerned about electric magnetic currents given off by the cables. 
all fish, and especially crustaceans, are very sensitive to any form of electrical currents. They will disperse from any area that generates electrical currents. Well, the cables give off electric currents that will disperse our sea life. It's not a river all the way up to the, and including Mount Mo Bay, has immense amounts of cohog beds. They're a major source of income to our cohog fishermen. How will the dredging of cables affect these beds? Previously, there were a few boats that would dredge cohogs with a dredge that went six inches to a foot into the sea floor. How will these interact with the cables? We also have many conch pots, fish pots, lost pots, and gill nets fishing in the Scar River from March through November. We are cons very concerned that fishing gear will damage during laying of the cables. We also want to make sure that a sea life is not dispersed in the area and creating a dead zone. There are several dragon fishermen that tow nests behind them on the seafloor. How will these react with the laying of the cables and after the cables are placed? When the Sakana River is being dredged with the cables, we anticipate there will be a massive mud plume created. The lobsters, crabs, and fish ingest the mud from these plumes. It blocks their gills and they die. We do not want a massive die off of our sea life in and around the Sakana River. We have a great contingent of recreational boaters at Sakana Harbor that most likely will be affected when the cable is being laid. Many of these boaters are recreational fishermen that contribute greatly to the town. We don't want them negatively impacted by the laying of the cable or any current coming through the cable. How will this be mitigated? As most people know, Sakana Point is a stopover port for boats coming from other ports and then heading to Martha's Vineyard in Antarctica. It's also a stopping point for boats when there's thick fog. How will these boats be affected? There are two pipelines that run across the Sakana River in the seabed. One is a gas, a gas pipeline, and the other is a water pipeline from Watson Reservoir. How does MW, which is now South Coast, plan on securing and getting past them? Obviously, it will be a static completion from all little town, from middle town, Tibet, and forward River shorelines. I should say Boston, I would hope. While well, the cables are being laid in the Star River. Also, many restaurants and beaches will be neg negatively impacted while the cables are being laid. So the town wholeheartedly whole concurs and supports the questions raised by the town of Portsmouth, which was back in August when you guys had questions. So we can with those. So thank you for hearing that. I appreciate it. I know it's not a formal hearing. Okay, no, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. My name is Jamie French, and I live in Jacob in Rhode Island. And um, yeah, when South Coast winds and says, oh, we're X amount of miles from a Massachusetts area, Nantucket, or Martha's Vineyard, we're in Rhode Island. I'd like to know how far we are from Rhode Island, how far we are from Sakonic Point. I mean, because that, that's what relates to us is, well, what relates to us, not how far you are from a Massachusetts company, the uh, com from Massachusetts, because this is a Massachusetts project. So why be in Rhode Island? I mean, I grew up here. I grew up on Mount Hope Bay, in the Connaught River, and Little Compton, Tiverton, Newport, Middletown, Bristol, Warren, Barrington, probably not Barrington so much, Fall River, Swansea, Somerset, and Portland. We're all part of this. We're all the water community. We're all one in this. And no one's getting any information other than Portsmouth. We are the only people that are being talked to. I have called and asked South Coast Wind. I've called and asked for callbacks. And I don't get callbacks. And because Tiverton's not affected. I mean, just because we're on this kind of river and Mount Hope Bay, we're not a host landing area. So we have no effect. Um, uh, we're not, not having any effect, but we're not important. Uh, can kind of wait. Um, <laughs> but South Coast Wind did ask Somerset for total zoning relief when they come to land. And the same for Falmouth. 
And that will probably be the same in Portsmouth. So that's something to think about, you know? And I know there's no permits been issued yet. And, and the reason is, is because back in, was it October, when Mayflower Wind um, asked Massachusetts to, um, to negate their PPA, and so that they could rewrite it at a higher consumer rate. And Massachusetts said no, and National Grid said no, either keep with the PPA or walk. They redid themselves. They, became, they went from Mayflower Wind to South Coast Wind and became an LLC. Um, they asked the state of Rhode Island at that point, Rhode Island PUC, asked for um, a show me that you are physically, uh, financially, fiscally responsible in order to do this project. They canceled the, what, the December meeting, the January meeting, and they went on, on permanent hold of like, we'll someday come in and talk to you. So now they're scheduled to come in in June. It's going to take at least another year if they get past that, that permit, that part of the fiscal pop. It'll take at least another year before they can even receive a permit from the state of Rhode Island. But as we've noticed, people just keep going forward. It's just like forward. Just like Vineyard Wind has four lawsuits in the courts, but they'll have those turbines twirling before the court cases are ever even heard in the courts, because that's how it works. Yeah, everything, everything is already on track. And if you don't have permits, they keep going anyway. The same thing's happening in New Jersey, where they've asked, they, they don't have the proper permits in place, but they're going forward without the permits. And, and that scares me that, that that's what's happening here because there's been six, seven, eight months of South Coast wind delaying their own permits in Rhode Island. Not us stopping them, but they're stopping themselves. And, you know, it, it, it's, I think, I think that we are in a experiment with unknown consequences. And that's how we're living, what we're living through right now. And we have no idea what's going to happen. No one even thinks about how will this affect the wind. They found from looking um, in Kansas, they found that the snowflakes behind the wind turbines seem to be causing a cyclonic chaotic wind factor, which no one knows about. That's not even being thought about. Or the delamination of the fiberglass blades and dropping into, well, in, in, in Kansas, it's dropping into the hay fields and, and I'm making the hay unusable. If animals eat it, it will kill them because it's like glass in your food, in human food. And so delamination, or the leading edge of the fiberglass blade falling into the water, what will that do to the animals, the whales as they're eating? What will happen to us if there's a hurricane and those fiberglass blades are caught in the wind and they're pelting us in our houses? Is there going to be a, who do we go to then? It's like, how do you prove that your windows were shattered by fiberglass projectiles that came off of blades? And, and that may not happen, but it may happen because we don't know. No one knows. No one knows. There's, there's so little science backing any of this because it's all a big experiment. But people in Europe and in Germany uh, are scared. And, and I have one last question. It's like we look at this and we say, why aren't there many American companies doing the wind farms or the wind factories off our coast? But Sweden wants to know how come the U.S. is building their turbines there. And that is a question. Why, why, why are we building in each other's countries and not alone? You know, why, why is that? What happens if, if by chance when they're doing these turbines off our coast, they discover oil? Does that mean that all of a sudden they're going to be looking for oil and drilling for oil? Will the oil begin to belong to them and not us? 
There's so many questions that I've answered. I know you're just working on the cables, but it's all relative and we have to look at this big situation. I really hope that you join in with Lil Compton and Middletown and say no to this project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're going to end our, our, our public. Can I just ask you one quick question? Really, just one quick question. It's something that you already talked about, and I just need to reiterate. If we already talked about it, then just catch me after the meeting. I mean, it's it's ten twenty. I, I, it's we've gone two seconds. So so I just wanted to. I just wanted to. Yeah. Oh, hey, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to clarify what your responsibilities were in this decision making. Like, um, what part of it do you actually have power to make? A decision about, I guess, is what I'm asking. So, what what it would be would be an advisory opinion, and and again, it the it's similar to what went on with the Old Mill Lane uh, EFSB decision. If in order for the EFSB to make a decision, they ask the town for an advisory opinion. So that's what our that's what we would be providing. Which so you are an advisory. What you're, you're an advisory. And yeah. So, yeah. so you're not like really making a but final very decision about it. Issues. We have no power to do that. Right. Okay, that's what I'm we wish we that, that's, right. what I'm, we that's, what, that's what I'm suggesting. That's what I'm wondering. Right. So the other question. Well, hey, you said one. No, I said two. No, I said two. <laughs> it's on the record. You can hear. Is this to the attorney? I'm sorry. No attorney. I forgot your name. I'm sorry. No attorney. We don't have an attorney. No attorney. Okay, then I'm just a guy trying to keep notes. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't, I'm not being disrespectful. No worries. Um, um, you said there was money uh, from South Coast to do some studies that you got from South Coast to do some studies. Somebody saw some checks. <laughs> but what kind of studies were those that got done? Are they independent economic or environmental impact studies, or what kind of studies? At, at, at this point, we did one. Economic, not economic, excuse me, one was, um, review no. of the uh, path. It was a review, a review of, of, the of the path where the cable would go. And that was and, by an independent and, and engineer. You, you hired a company to do that? Yes. What company was that? Oh, I'm trying to stand up. Far, far, far engineering. Far engineering, there. And far engineering did a review of the application. Uh, it's a direct par. Yeah. All right. Par. Folks, I, I just got a message. We have to be out of here by 1030. Okay. We have four minutes. The custodians no. need us out. Yeah, so it's, it's a draft huh? and it hasn't been what? It's a draft and it hasn't been. I, I, I have a question. I have an answer to those. We're going to help them to review Post them on the website underneath the winning power. Thank you. I, I do want to thank, thank everybody. Um, thank you. Please stay tuned. I mean, obviously, nothing has yeah, been decided. Um, we're, there's the. You know, the process is still ongoing. So, also, just say thank you from South Coast Wind. We, we really appreciate being here and you've given the opportunity to listen. So, thank you. Oh, hold on one second. The motion. Thank you. Motion, motion, motion to adjourn. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Supposed to be voice votes. You get, <laughs> no, we don't have to do that. No, no we don't. Not, no. not yet. No. No. You get kudos.